Rewind of the Living Dead is a review show, so spoilers are ahead. In 1986, the Friday the 13th franchise found itself at a crossroads. After six films and hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, the once feared hockey mask killer was starting to wane with audiences. Friday producer Frank Mancuso Jr. even teased the idea of Jason battling his box office nemesis, Freddy, to catch some of the attention his slasher foe had garnered. It was producer Barbara Sachs who finally posited the idea that it was time to elevate the series even suggesting making a film worthy of an Academy Award, with talks of famed Italian director Federico Fellini being brought on board. They ultimately settled on genre director John Carl Beekler, who took a script that pitted Jason against a Carrie-like character with telekinetic powers. This would forever change the franchise from a man in the woods to a monster of mythic proportions. Larpark Lincoln would star as Tina, a young woman returning to the site of a family tragedy where she accidentally resurrects the most fabled killer in Crystal Lake from the dead, and audiences were introduced to the most prolific actor to ever don the mask. This is the one you've been waiting for. What's happening to me? Your psychokinesis and these delusions are... No, you're not listening to me! The one you've been asking for. Hey, T. Isn't this the way they wear their jackets back in the mental hospital? <laughs> concentrate. Concentrate, Tina. The one you've been dying for. You people give me the creeps. Okay, you big hunk of a man, come and get me. Jason ah! is back. Die. Someone is waiting. In the latest episode of Rewind of the Living Dead, we're going to break out the pearl necklaces and resurrect our dead dads as we review the 1988 classic, Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. Welcome back to Rewind of the Living Dead. I'm Damon Martin. And I'm Patrick Lar Lincoln. <laughs> and tonight, Patrick, it is a special episode of Rewind of the Living Dead, earlier than normal, because it is Friday the 13th. And how could we not celebrate such a special holiday in the month of October without talking about your favorite slasher franchise? And tonight, we are talking about your all-time favorite Friday the 13th movie, Part 7 the new blood oh damon how lucky were we to get a friday the 13th in october we got to do a friday the 13th episode and, and if since it's that special since all the stars have aligned we had to do my absolute favorite friday the 13th part seven the new blood and damon i'm going to tell you right now why it's so special to me because i'm going to be very honest with you it's not the best friday the 13th movie out there it's really not I love it, and it's got a lot of great qualities, but I wouldn't call it the best one. But what it is, Damon, and this is so important, this is my true very first horror movie that I ever watched. It came out in 88. It was probably in homes by 89 pretty quickly, and I watched it on TV and on VHS with my cousins at my aunt's house. She was a big horror gal herself. She'd stay up all night watching horror movies. This, at you know about eight years old, which is the age my son is now, I watched this movie in full and took in horror for the first time in a real and true way, not in bits and pieces and not like, 
oh, okay, I kind of saw a piece of that movie and I saw a piece of that one and that one scared me and this one scared me. This was me fully absorbing a horror film. And this started everything for me, Damon. The reason I stand here today with you talking about horror films as we have done for the past four years is because of Friday the 13th, The New Blood. So this was your Night of the Living Dead, because I've told the story on the podcast before. When I was a little kid, younger than eight years old, I snuck into the living room and my parents were watching a movie with their friends and it was Night of the Living Dead. And I peeked around the corner of the couch and there was Night of the Living Dead. And it was immediately like, what? what is this? What am I watching? And it scared the hell out of me when I was like five years old. So this was kind of that intro for you. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a peek around the corner. It was like a sitting down, watching the thing beginning to end. Because I think I'd probably seen bits and pieces of things like Texas Chainsaw and Friday, uh, uh, you know, other Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Streets and all those. I'd kind of seen pieces of it. But this was me absorbing it and going, I want to sit down and watch horror movies. And I did. And I you know, sat, watched it from beginning to end. I, the beginning of this movie is just so super memorable and all the way to the end of it, of course. But like this was like the full movie. Like what? I, this is the first time I can remember watching a full horror movie beginning to end over and over and over and over again. So this was your introduction to horror in general. Do you remember, like, did you immediately fall in love with the Friday the 13th franchise at that point? Like, when did your, when did your full fandom for the franchise come about? This is where it started. Now, I, now, like you, I think both you and I grew up knowing that the hockey mask meant Jason Voorhees. Even my kids know that. They've never watched a Friday the 13th movie. It's that iconic of a symbol. So you and I knew it growing up, and I knew what Friday the 13th was, and I knew what Jason Voorhees was, Jason Voorhees was, but I wasn't absorbing it in a real way. And this was the first movie where I was like, oh my God, like the characters, Tina, you know, the star of the movie, and then Jason himself. I think really it was Jason. I think in the new blood and most horror aficionados will know that Friday the 13th, the new blood. And I said a little bit about it in the intro, it introduced the world to Kane Hodder as Jason. And so this was my first real absorption of Jason. I'd seen bits and pieces of him again before with the, the bag over the head. And I knew the mom had been the killer, but this was the first time I'd seen Jason in his full glory. And he's, and he's, He's in this movie from a pretty early stage and he's it's Kane Hodder under all these crazy prosthetics because this Jason is like, according to John Carl Beekler, the director, the, Jason's been sitting in that lake since part six for almost 10 years, for roughly 10 years. Now that fucks with the timeline. So don't even start asking about like what year is exactly this taking place. According to the, according to the director, Jason's been sitting in that lake for 10 years. And so he, he's, he's, he's got skull, uh, his skeleton's exposed. His face is exposed. The damage on his mask is from all of the accumulation of the things that he's gone through in the previous Friday films. I saw that and said, whatever that is, I fuck with that. Whatever that is, that's my shit. This is a big bruiser of a killer. He's sort of a zombie. He's got the cool mask on. He looks great. You know, Kane's, Kane's a guy who's in good shape, got big, broad shoulders. And it's just, I was like, that motherfucker's cool. Just like, just like a kid would have like seen like a star quarterback and be like, that motherfucker's cool. I want to be like that guy. Me, instead of quarterbacks or basketball players, it was Jason Voorhees. And very specifically, it was Kane Hodder's Jason Voorhees. And I think we'll get into that later in the show about what makes it so special because really Jason, I, I think you would agree with me, Damon, Jason's never stood out until Kane Hodder got under the mask. Yeah. It's funny when you go back and we've reviewed uh, Friday the 13th part one, two, three, and four, and then we didn't yeah. do five or six. And now here at seven, we even commented when we, when we did two, cause that's really the first appearance of Jason. Like how that Jason, like I, Friday the 13th part two is one of my favorites. But it's also, uh, you know, he's like just a dude, Jason. Like, there's nothing really scary about him besides the fact that he's carrying around an axe or a pitchfork or whatever killing machine he's using. Uh, he just looks like a dude. 
And it wasn't until part three when they started using bigger actors to portray Jason, and that's where we see the hockey mask for the first time. But even then, he didn't really look that much bigger. Now, I will say it does make me laugh because Kane Hodder started the fascination with Jason just getting bigger and bigger because by the time they get to Friday, the th- by the time they get to Friday, Freddy versus Jason and they got Ken Kersinger in there, he looks like a freaking ginormous, like pro wrestler in there. Like he looks yeah. huge. It's just funny because when you think back about part two, it looks just like a five foot 10, like scrawny <laughs> dude playing Jason. And then you get up to this one and Jason looks like he's a big, scary motherfucker. Like he's a big dude. Um, it always made me laugh. I will say this, Patrick, and I'm saying this as an outsider looking in because I'm not as attached to the Friday the 13th franchise as you are, although I have seen all the films. Um, This one, when I watched it, I've seen it before, but I hadn't watched it many, many years. So I sat down and watched it. I watched it twice getting ready for this podcast. This was a real departure from all the other Friday films before it for a couple reasons. One, the big one I noticed was, of course, the Jason makeup. He looked... I know I joked on this show in one of our past episodes. I was trying to get you to answer, like, what is Jason? He's basically a zombie, right? Because he never he never yeah. stops and is like, hey, let me get a cheeseburger. I'm hungry. So he's basically <laughs> like a zombie. I was like, that's what he is, right? Like, he's a zombie. Um, they make him look like a zombie in this movie. His, are his hands in particular were one of my favorite things. You see, like, the skin peeled back. And you can see the skeleton a little bit underneath part of the fingers. He yeah. looks monstrous in this movie which not to say he didn't look monstrous before but he just looked like a a a big guy killing people this one he actually looks like a monster like he looks just defiled and and gross and and you know decayed and you know all that kind of stuff so that's part one part two you're gonna laugh when i say this because a lot of the elements in this movie are the same as the other friday the 13th movie right unsuspecting teens show up at crystal lake Jason Voorhees starts killing them. They're, they're all pretty similar, right? Like, let's be honest. They're not reinventing the wheel with anything they do in the Friday the 13th movies up till when they try to do it with Jason Takes Manhattan, and that just goes completely awry. Uh, <laughs> at least, well, at least then they just take him to a different location, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. What I noticed about this movie for the first time, I would argue maybe since part four, but even you could argue since part two, really, when Jason first appears. They really tried to make a plot for this movie. Now I'm not I'm not insulting the other Friday movies, but let's be honest. Like none of them none of them really had a script or a plot where you're like, man, the story really drew me into the characters. Um, this one actually made that attempt. And I was like, this is a real departure because for the largest part, every other Friday the thirteenth movie is dumb teen show up. They start porking, Jason shows up and starts hacking. Like, that's pretty much the plot of all the movies. And Damon, I think that's why part seven was different. And you you mentioned, I think part two is probably the the other one that has the most plot in it because it is the fallout from part one. So that makes sense. And, uh, you know, part four is really, I think, in my opinion, part four is probably the best overall of all of them. But it is just campers and teens in the woods getting chased down by Jason. That's really what it is. It's there's, there's not much to that story, but after part f- part five, which we all know is the copycat killer that is reviled by most fans. And then part six, which was almost a satirization. It's loved by many. I'm not a particularly big fan of it because it almost kind of makes fun of, of the, of the series, which is fine by the way. But it all it kind of it kind of took the piss out of the series. They were like, "Shit, this isn't really like working anymore." Like the box office numbers weren't quite hitting like they like they used to when the first four came out. The first four are fantastic movies, and they deserve all the praise that they get. And then five is weak. It's got a super weak ending. And then six, it it's kind of met with tepid response. So they they really they rehuddled. Uh, the the producing group rehuddled and said, "What do how do how do we change this?" And um, it was that that uh, that um, uh, the the producer, uh, what's her name, Sarah? I have, oh, Barbara Sachs. Yeah, Barbara Sachs was one of the producers on the film. And at first, she just said, uh, "You know, w- what's the script we got?" And the script was written by Daryl Haney and Manuel Fidello. And I'm gonna tell you something right now, Damon. As I digress all over the place here. 
Manuel Fidelo is a fake name. They hired a WGA writer to do punch-ups on the script, and they they made him take a fake name because they didn't pay him scale and all that stuff. And they were kind of skirting all the rules and stuff. So Manuel Fidelo doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, between those two guys, they came up with this this Jason versus Carey, which is basically what they ended up with. And so uh, Barbara Sachs says, Jason versus Carey, okay, that's cool. We can't do Jason versus Carey because we don't own the rights. MGM owns them. And we wouldn't, we can't even bother. This is going to be a super low budget movie. So we're not even playing that game. So let's make a carry composite, a, a carry, you know, a facsimile, if you will. And they came up with Tina. And this, I think what this movie does is it finally gives Jason a proper opponent. And in a very unsuspecting, it's a very kind of like meek, kind of uh, troubled final girl in in tina and i think that's what that's what sets this apart and tina has a very distinct storyline in this movie it almost kind of reminds me a little bit of uh dream warriors which i know is your favorite uh, nightmare on elm street where it's like this is the story of 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 teens who are going through something and then the killer gets in the way of what they're going through that's very much what this movie's about it's about tina and i think because you finally have a main character with goals all of her own that is she that she's trying to kind of get through and then our, you know our, our famous killer gets in the way and then she's got these powers which okay that's goofy and weird but why the fuck not you know like we've already determined that jason can come back from the dead so what what matters that she has telekinetic powers fuck it doesn't matter he's a zombie let her have telekinetic powers all bets are off at this point then you get that last 30 minutes, which is a real showdown. And to me, Damon, this movie has some of the best, like overall set pieces in the, in the series, especially in the beginning with kind of her little cold open origin story and her, and in the end, especially with her facing down Jason with all of her telekinetic abilities, this is one of the, it's a really heightened movie. It, it really, it really goes above and beyond what Friday the 13th normally does. First off, what was the guy's name, Manuel? What is it? Oh, Manuel Fidelo. <laughs> so I'm just telling you right now, and I'm I'm probably letting a secret out of the bag here. If you and I ever have to go on the run for some terrible crime we've committed, <laughs> I'm just letting people know right now, you will be Manuel Fidelo and I will be Ramon Bravo. I'm just letting you know, <laughs> be our alias. Ramon Bravo. Ramon Ramon the, the, the stunt the stunt man from zombie he will be uh taking over as my as my alias and in, uh, in the uh when i go on the run somewhere and you'll be manuel fidello um yeah that'll be it um so okay so when it comes to the plot of this movie like as i said this movie actually has a plot which i was pretty happy about because while i i guess it's been well documented, Patrick. I'm the story guy. I, I needed I need a I need a plot, I need a story. And part of the reason I was so attracted to the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise was because to me, of all the slasher franchises, um, and if you want to include like Texas Chainsaw on there and, and, and Friday the thirteenth and Halloween, Halloween does have a story, and even though they they've changed it and retconned it a bunch of times, it has a story. But I would argue Freddy Krueger probably has the deepest story, like in terms of like yeah. connection to the characters when you go from Nancy uh, and, and then go into part three. I I, I kind of skip over part two, but then part three with Dream Warriors, then you go into, into Dream Master with Alice. And I would say they have the strongest plot attempts in, in all the slasher and the new nightmare going on to the mind. Maybe that's part of the reason I never really got drawn as much into the Friday the 13th series, because while I do appreciate the really cool creative kills, I absolutely do. I still appreciate story. And got to be honest, that's kind of where Friday the 13th falls apart, because there isn't a story for the most, you know, the ones I really enjoyed in the past, part two has a story. Part mm -hmm. four. Not the most intricate story, but I enjoy the execution. You know, the one guy coming back to avenge his sister, and then you got uh, a young Corey Feldman with the whole shaving his head to kind of fool Jason, which I, I love that. You know, again, yeah. not, not super deep. It's not, you know, you're not writing in the, you know, you're not writing a Martin Scorsese movie or anything, but it's still got a good twist there. And I like that. Part seven makes like a legitimate attempt to making a plot. Like they introduce this Tina character. Now, 
I'll be honest, Patrick, when I first saw this again, and I hadn't seen it in many years, my first reaction to the whole telekinetic powers was like, really? This is mm-hmm. where we're going? Like, suddenly a girl just has telekinetic powers? Because no other version of any of the people Jason has gone after actually have powers. Yes, he is a zombie killing machine, but unlike the Friday, unlike the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, which established in part one that Nancy could travel into her dreams and battle Freddy and then draw him out of her dreams, they already introduced a lot of supernatural elements in that movie for both the main character being Freddy and the characters battling him. They already inter- So when you go into Dream Warriors and Dream Master, you're just extending on the original m- mythology. They never did that with this film. Like when the character for part one dies, or part the character for part one kills Mrs. Voorhees and then Jason kills her at the part, start of part two, she doesn't come back from the dead. Um, right. Same thing with part two and go so on down the line. Like characters who die don't just come back like, oh, I'm back to get you, Jason, I'm alive. So the telekinesis thing right away, I was kind of like, I bumped up against it. Because I was like, really? Like, we can't find, like, a legitimate opponent for Jason, so we're just going to create somebody with, like, carry like powers. But <laughs> while I did bump up against a little bit, and I do have some plot holes I want to discuss a little bit later on. Let's do it. <laughs> but while I did bump up against that in the beginning, I was still like, this is fun. The showdown, as you mentioned, the big showdown of the last 30 minutes where it really is Jason versus Tina, I was like, this is kind of fun because the reality is because Jason is just a big hulking zombie killing machine. Yes, in part eight, they do have somebody try to box Jason, which is interesting (laughs) to say the least. They have someone actually try to fist fight Jason. They tried. It doesn't work and it ends terribly, but they tried. And that was what clicked in my head because even though part eight is let's be honest it's terrible um i was thinking of that scene in my head where the boxer goes up and he's like punching (laughs) jason i'm like all right okay and then i went back to part seven i'm like okay so you can't just have a dude fight jason or a girl fight jason because he's just a big huge killing machine he's not gonna talk you down he's not gonna you know, it, it's none of that. He's going to just try to kill you, and it's going to be a pretty boring fight because you're going to th- throw a couple punches, and he's going to kill you. That's it. There's no yeah. fight. You can run. That's part of the plot of all the other movies, but ultimately you're not really fighting Jason. So when they introduced the telekinesis at the beginning, I was like, oh, really? Like, we got to introduce special powers? Like, now we're just like, suddenly she's an Avenger? Um, <laughs> but then as I watched it and I got to the, the battle at the end and I, and I saw the cool, like, you know, the twists and, and electrocuting Jason and the hanging Jason and the pissing on him with gasoline, which is one of the funnier effects in this movie. <laughs> um, I was like, you know what? This is like an actual battle. And I, as a, maybe call me sexist, Patrick, I'm, I'm not, but call me, I like final girls. I like the final girl mythos in horror movies horror movies are one of the only like while horror films in general get a lot of criticism for the unnecessary nudity and deaths of women i understand that but i also appreciate that by and large the majority of the characters who survive and defeat the villain in most of the big slasher franchises are women that's where the whole trope of the final girl started with laurie strode uh, you could argue Sally Hardesty, but I would say, you know, Laurie Strode really blew it up. And then, of course, Nancy Thompson, you know, go on and so so on and so forth. Um, I like that it's a showdown between a woman and Jason. And, and just being honest, if it's just a woman and Jason and they're just fighting, it's not going to be much of a fight. Giving her powers, because why the fuck not, made sense and it actually made for a pretty epic showdown at the end. So, again... In theory, I did bump up against it. I'm like, how do we how do we fight Jason differently? Oh, let's give her powers. And I'm like, all right, this is a this might be a bridge too far. But then when it actually happened at the end, I was kind of like, you know what? This is kind of fun. I really liked Laura Park Lincoln's um, performance, uh, and the powers were interesting, and it gave her a weapon to use against Jason that's not like a hatchet or a, or a machete. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna have fun with this, and that's ultimately what I did. Yeah, and I think, I really think that the telekinetic aspect of it came from the success of Nightmare on Elm Street. When Jason came out, I mean, when Freddy came out, he started kicking Jason's ass at the box office. 
he was just so much more dynamic. There's so much more going on. There is a story going on in those movies. There's, there, it's a very clear story going on in those movies. And there's supernatural powers. One through four of, of uh, Friday the 13th, no supernatural ability. The dude's is just hard to kill. And five, as far as we're concerned, he's dead in five. And then in six, he gets resurrected by a lightning bolt, which which the director's intention was sort of to poke fun at the series. Like, oh, I guess the only way you can get him get him to be resurrected is to through lightning like he's Frankenstein or something. And so they go, well, we got to run with that. But how do we give it that like that Freddy element? And I think the Freddy element comes in with Tina. It's just this this idea that. If you're going to fight supernatural, you better use supernatural against it. That's the only way around it. And it was interesting. And they gave her this this whole storyline. And if you haven't seen part seven, the new blood, it starts with this flashback of a, a little girl running out of a house at the lake. Uh, her parents are arguing and things are going bad in there. And she she gets into a boat into the middle of the lake. Her dad comes out to kind of apologize and he's like, you're saying, Tina, come back, come back. And she's so mad at him for hurting her mom. And she's like, no, I hate you. And all of a sudden she starts kind of like doing something with her face. And you realize that there's like a telekinetic thing going on. And she, she rocks this pier that he's standing on and it breaks down and it kills him and he disappears into the lake. <laughs> those, those are the, no, no one recovered the body. He just goes into the lake. This is the 80s, and this is how we're going to be with, with the logic. So you set up that there's this girl with supernatural abilities, and then you cut to present day. She comes back to the lake to kind of work with her therapist because she's clearly on the brink, and she may even be going into uh, like an asylum or something because she's having trouble with with uh, her, her, her telekinetic issues and, and her memories around the death of her father and causing the death of her father. So they come back to the scene of the crime. Her and her doctor, played by Damon. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> played by Weekend at Bernie's himself. A zombie himself, Terry Kaiser, plays her doctor. And her mom, they, the three of them come back to the scene of where her dad died to try and help her work through all of this stuff. And one night during the tests, she's getting frustrated. She runs outside and really she just wants her dad back. She misses her dad. She didn't want to do that to her dad. She has no control over, the, over these powers. And she looks into that lake and she kind of wishes him to reappear. Well, shit, she was standing at the wrong fucking bank on, on that night because she fucking cut the chains and let loose the dog himself, Jason Voorhees. And he comes right up out of the lake and she's like, what the fuck is that? And she just, <laughs> she fucking runs. Well, she passes out. Yeah, she passes out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. She does pass out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but it's, you know, like she was there for another purpose. And then Jason gets in the way of that purpose. So now, so there's there's now these two subjects that will collide eventually at the end in a big showdown. You see what Tina is capable of because she killed her dad using her telekinetic powers. And you know what Jason's capable of, and then he gets to show you what he's capable of throughout the movie, or does he a little bit? We might talk about that in just a second. Does he really show you what he's capable of? The MPAA said, no, we don't want to show you what he's capable of. Um, but it leads to a showdown. So there's there's something, there's an engine that drives this movie. It's not just like, how do we get two teenagers to take their clothes off and be in a quiet place by themselves to get murdered? Because that's how we've been doing it since the beginning. It's like, no, we need to barrel towards something. And, you know, listen, again, is it perfect? No, but is it entertaining? Hell fucking yeah, it is. I know I'm overthinking this, Patrick, but listen. <laughs> Guaranteed. Entire, we, did, we did the entire Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, and you had to question parts. You questioned parts of Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and, and I had to defend my all-time favorite Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions about the plot in this movie, because I am curious. Let's do it. So Bernie, Dr. Bernie, uh, <laughs> he, brings, he brings Tina to the lake to help her face the reality of what she's been, the trauma she dealt with with killing her father. First off, can I mention that the whole i want my father back could they have not made the the way she killed him different than like he beats her mom like could they not have just made him like like he cheated on her or something because like 
beating your mom and you're like, I want my dad back. That sounds. I'm just saying, like it, maybe in like the '80s it wasn't as bad. I'm not yeah, like, that's the but, that's the '80s talking. But I'm like, I'm like, you beat her. You he beats the crap out of your mom and you still want him back. I'm like, that seems a little bit weird. That's just a that's a minor plot point. I was like, really? That's the guy you want back? Okay. <laughs> Anyways, here's my question. We know that Doctor Bernie is up to no good. Right, like he's not really there for Tina's benefit, and, he, and his her mom discovers a recording where she talks about it, and you find that that one spike that Jason used to kill somebody, and that he hid from her to make her think she was imagining things. Patrick, what was Doctor Bernie actually after? Like, what was he trying to get Tina to do? Because they never really tell you in this movie. You just know he's a bad guy. But, like, is he trying to become Magneto? Like, is he trying to take over the world with his mutant? Like, what is he trying to do? Is he trying to make a circus performer and he wants her to move shit? Like, does he need a mover and he wants to start a moving company and she's going to move shit with, with her mind? Like, what is he trying to accomplish? I think it's the answer is all of the above. No. Um, but truth be told, it, it is in that little in that little uh, uh, tape recording that, that Tina's mom finds. He wants to be the person who discovers and shows the world that telekinesis is real. Now that's a flimsy little thing to stand on. And truth be told, you know, again, guys, we're talking about the 1980s fucking horror movie plots. Like don't, don't go deep diving. Cause you, cause it's just, no, there ain't nothing but muck down there. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like on the surface of it all, the idea was that he wanted to expose the fact that telekinesis was real. The problem with that, Damon, before you continue on with your questions is why the hell did he give a shit about Jason? Because yeah. he had in his in his desk like papers he knew about Jason. He was he was the most curious thing to me is why he hid the the stake that she yeah. at one point she goes, I saw him outside and he stuck a stake in the side of the house. And then when they go out there to look, the stake's not there because he took it. I don't know when he had time to do that, but he did. I was like, why is he trying to hide the Jason part? That part never, and it's even after the last watch, I rewinded a few times and I go, that still doesn't make sense. I don't know where, again, you know, the, the, the script was written by somebody who takes zero credit and probably for good reason. And I imagine there was a lot of rewriting on set as well, that a lot of those little details got lost in the production. Yeah, I was just curious because like it never really it was never totally clear. And I guess maybe that's it was just he was meant to be the evil manipulative yeah. doctor. And I was kind of like, but what is his end goal here? Like, if, OK, if it's proven that but even that like proving telekinesis exists, well, he sees her do it multiple times. Why isn't he running to the papers? Like, look at this shit. Like, I know he's trying to get her to control it, but like the TV comes flying at his head. He's got his proof. Like, what is he real? I, I just, it was just weird. And I know I'm overthinking it for like, what is not really an intricate. Yeah. Plot, they they didn't, like, they didn't overthink it either. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, this is a weird, like loose thread that like, he's trying to manipulate her and make her think she's going crazy, which kind of is counterintuitive to what he wants out of the whole situation because he wants her, if he wants her to prove that she's telekinetic and telekinesis is real. Wouldn't he want her to believe in herself? Not the other way around. I don't again. Sorry. I'm just like the Dr. Bernie character was like the one part of this movie where I was kind of like, what is he doing? Why are we here with him? Like, what was his purpose? This whole thing. All we know is, is he's an asshole. All we know is he's, he's really a manipulative asshole. I mean, he even gets her mom killed at one point. Cause he's a dirt bag and he uses her as a yeah. shield. But, like, I was just, like, we know he's scummy. We can tell he's scummy. But, like, why is he scummy? Why? What, 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 was his, what was the purpose of all the scum? Because I never totally, like, they, they make him a creepy character. And, and Terry Kaiser, uh, Bernie, as I keep calling him, uh, which, by the way, let me just tell the backstory on that. I, I was watching this movie, and I was like, where do I know this guy from? So I looked up his IMDb page, and the first hit is Weekend at Bernie's. He plays Bernie at Weekend at Bernie's. I was like, oh! Oh, it's bernie yeah he didn't have the mustache in this one so i didn't recognize him um but like that was my whole thing i was like what is his like we know he's a jerk we know he's kind of a creepy dude but like what was his purpose that was my whole like i kept bumping up against that because i'm just like well he's manipulating her and he's telling her that she's crazy is he trying to just keep her under his control at the hospital but yet he's trying to expose that this is it was just a again 
Yeah. I'm overthinking it. I know I'm overthinking it, but it was just a weird, like, it was just a weird thing that kept coming back to me during this movie. Like, and then you mentioned the Jason thing. He had all these files on Jason. And then, yeah, like, I was like, so does Jason have carry powers? Like, what is he trying to, what is this dude? Like, what is your agenda, Dr. <laughs> was it Dr. Cruz? What is your Dr. Agenda? Cruz? Yeah. Yeah. It, it was very the nun franchise. It's like, well, there's too much stuff going on, guys. <laughs> pare down. Like, believe me, you guys need to pare down. Like, you don't, you don't need to overcomplicate this thing. Please pare it down a little bit. Cause yeah, like, I was like, okay, I'm fine with him, like, trying to expose telekin telekinesis to the world. But like, then why was the Jason stuff throws it completely out the window? It's a <laughs> typical, typical like '80s slasher shit where you're like, okay, you guys went too, you guys went too far when you really didn't need to. It was a subplot that didn't need to be there because, in all honesty, Patrick, the actual plot of Tina accidentally killing her father, returning to the site of that to deal with the trauma with her therapist, and him like forcing her to deal with that trauma. And that how, you know, that's what leads to Jason being resurrected. That all actually makes perfect sense. I mean, if, yes. we, if we're going to believe telekinesis, it's the weird subplot of what his, like, we, we, they had to make the doctor a scummy dude. Yeah. And while I'm fine with that, we, he, listen, he was just creepy enough. Like, you didn't need to make him any creepier. You could just make him creepy. Like, all he had to do at one point, Patrick, and I know this sounds insanely creepy, but I'm just getting my point across. At one point, all he had to do was creepily put his hands on, like, Tina's shoulders, and you could tell that he's, like, you know. Right. You'd be happy to see him get yeah, fucking. Yeah, that's all you, you had to do. You don't have to confuse we his ideas. Yeah, we, yeah. Didn't, we, didn't need to, we didn't need the manipulation and the weird, like, the Jason file, and, like, he's, like, works for, you know, he works for Mulder and Scully trying to discover if Jason's out there. I don't know what he was doing. Like, right. You can, you can drop all that and just make him a creepy dude preying on a, on a damaged teenage girl. And if I was remake, yeah, if I was remaking this movie, I would make Dr. Cruz a complete good guy who's trying to help her harness her powers. Yeah. And Jason is the complication. Don't, you don't need another complication. We've got, yeah. Jason's complicated enough. Yeah, like, you don't, like you don't he, to, he could help her harness to, those powers. Yeah, you don't need to make him, like, if you're going to make him creepy, just make him creepy. But if, otherwise, he doesn't need to be creepy. He could just be a doctor. Like, I don't, maybe, maybe it was the way yeah. Terry Crews was playing it, or Terry Kaiser was playing it, and they're just like, yeah, dude, like, you're kind of weird. Okay, let's let's go with this. You seem a little pedophile <laughs> here. Let's go ahead and make it into a full-on creep. Like, I don't know. C creeps are very on brand with the franchise, by the way. So that, that part that part checks out. But, yeah, I mean, I think you would, in a remake, I would, I would very much simplify that to just letting him be a man mentor yeah but here listen ultimately here we are talking about the plot of this movie and we really couldn't do that with a lot of the friday the 13th movies and, and i no. appreciate that that they actually really tried to make a story out of this um and i gotta be honest like in terms of of characters that i remember from this franchise like of course we all remember it was it alice from the first one and who was the heroine in the second one the one who my favorite where she puts on jason's mother's oh sweater. gosh uh, i can't remember her name yeah, right now like but the, yeah i know one, what you're talking about you know that one and of course you got Corey feldman's character who comes back in part six with the whole lightning bolt uh was his tommy name? jarvis got got tommy, a three-story arc yeah, yeah tommy jarvis or three three series arc yeah and a lot of people believe like it's kind of like when you think about the uh like when you think about halloween you think about laurie strobe when you think about nightmare on elm street you think of nancy thompson a lot of people when they talk about friday the 13th, they think of tommy jarvis like tommy jarvis is the is the is the the equal to you know he's the anti-jason he's the equal to jason the guy who survived yeah. i would argue that tina is a much better uh you know a much better opposition not just because she has powers i mean obviously that gives her an advantage but i'm just saying like in terms of compelling character and story mm -hmm. i like tina vastly more than i like tommy jarvis and that's me saying originally that i like i think part four was one of my favorite parts and i still love that movie i really do enjoy that movie but yeah. tina was a much more compelling character because they gave her more story because tommy jarvis was ultimately just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like his family was just staying at camp. This is the plot of every other Friday the Thirteenth. They just happened to be staying at Camp Crystal Lake when Jason goes right. to the killing spree. They had no purpose being there. Uh, this one actually had a purpose being there. Tina actually needed to be there. She was there because she had accidentally killed her father years earlier. So I would argue that like Tina is the best 
final girl or final, you know, whoever, like the, the best opposition that Jason ever faced. Ever, ever, ever. And I'm so lucky that like, that was my first introduction. Cause I mean, it's, it's very easy to understand why, um, uh, Heather Langenkamp's character in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Why can't it? Nancy? Na it's, Nancy. It makes total sense why Nancy Thompson. Why you latch on to her? You know, she she she's she's very important to everything that's going on. Tina is very important to what's happening, and she's the reason Jason's there. That's like a double complication. There's her world, and then there's her. There's the sin that she commits, which is which is you know killing her father and then there's there's a a sin upon a sin which is she accidentally raises a bloodthirsty killer and she has to she has to rectify that this is all her story and maybe something in me as a kid was just like i know how to like absorb this you know like i at that same age i was big on like the never-ending story and the never-ending story it, it had two great characters in it the kid who's reading the book in the real world and a tray you who's in in the actual story themselves like you kind of latch onto them because they had they they're going through shit they're not just being chased they're not just fodder for a machete as cool as those kills are most of those people it's just like how do i get away from this fucking blade that's coming at me tina's got more to think about and and i do think lar, lar park lincoln carried it well you know she was at the time, one of the more experienced actors, Terry Kaiser being the most experienced at the time, but Lar Park Lincoln had done some some commercial work and I think a couple of soap opera guest spots at the time. So she even had a little bit of chops to her. And I, like all of that just counted towards a compelling character, which Damon, we said about it with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. We talked about it with Scream, obviously with Halloween and Laurie Strode. When you have a strong character, it gives us something to hold on to. It gives us someone to root for. Not You don't just want to see them live. You want to see them live for reasons. You have stakes in their survival. And that's Tina in this movie. And I think if you did a remake today, you might introduce her in the first movie and have the next two movies in the trilogy be about Tina. It, it, it just, it works so well. And... Can you name outside of Tommy Jarvis, who just I think Tommy Jarvis caught on because Corey Feldman was Tommy Jarvis first. But like, it's not like he's a big player in part five or six. It's just he's just the guy who was dodging the machete and he's got to dodge it two more times. That's all it is. Yeah. Tina has something. Tina and, and I can't name another person that's gone against Jason. Tina's the one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 the most compelling version of a character because and that's and also you know to their to their credit or discredit, you know the Friday the Thirteenth people really wrote themselves into a corner when they made Jason this unstoppable <laughs> killing machine who doesn't do anything but kill. Like there's no other story there because after they like the first movie has a real plot, like the first movie has I would argue probably the best plot because the twist at the end with finding out it's his mother is the killer yeah. she was jason's mother that's iconic um and then part two when they actually introduced jason that was the original wrong place wrong time campers and that all made sense and i still love that movie especially as i mentioned earlier the scene where the girl puts on jason's mother's sweater and talks to him and says jason you listen to mother i love that that's yeah. one of my probably my cool. favorite scene in Friday the Thirteenth history, I always remember that scene where she makes Jason get down on his knees. It's oh, I love that scene. It's so good. Um, that one, okay. So that's like the the original version of the story. Part three is literally just people showing up at a cabin and Jason hacks them to death. Part four, people show up at a cabin, Jason finds them and starts hacking them to death. Part five, some dude named Roy decides to put on <laughs> Roy. Some dude named Roy. I think it was Roy. Yeah. Them. Puts on the mask and decides to hack people and start killing them. Part six, same thing. Like, it's literally the same movie, just different versions of how you get to Jason. By part seven, they actually gave us a story again, and they actually gave us a connection for the lead character. Since the first movie, there's not been any real connection to the character until now, when Tina accidentally kills her father, who apparently was a shitbag, by the way, uh, yeah. kills her dad and then tries to bring him back to life which again we could bump up against the reasons for bringing him back 
guilt, whatever you want to say, I get it. And then she accidentally resurrects Jason, not knowing that Jason is down there hanging out with her dad at the bottom of the lake. Um, it, it makes it makes sense. It actually makes sense. Like it's the first time I know that sounds terrible. It's the first time since the first one that anything really truly made sense. Well, the second one because the second one was the original. Just yeah. people happen to go camping, and then Jason shows up for the first time. But uh, every everything after that was a facsimile of that one. But this one actually attempts now. Patrick, I do want to segue before we get into categories and everything. I do want to segue into one other com one other piece of information because I mentioned this to you. I was watching the movie, and I texted you during it, and we started the conversation, and we're going to continue it right now. I want to talk about because one of the most iconic parts about Friday the Thirteenth, and one of the things you fell in love with, was the creative kills. That's part of what makes Jason who Jason is is the weird creative way he kills people. And I noticed watching this, I texted you and I was like, the, the the kills are cool, but where's the blood? Like, there's no gore. It's weird. Like, this feels so different than all the yeah. other Friday the 13th movies. And you actually were the one who kind of told me about this. Yeah. So th the th this, by the way, was a whirlwind production because they actually missed. They were releasing one every year. And then in 87, they screwed up. And the rights, they were having fights with rights and, and, and they were, they were moving from one studio to the next. And, uh, so they, they missed their window of releasing every single year. So they were in this mad dash to make sure they got something out in 88. So the whole production from pre-production to delivering it was five months, which is zero time. Even, even in 1988, that is like no time to do a movie. So they rushed this movie out there. Well, when they, you know, you, you get it all wrapped up, you, 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 you shoot like hell and you get this thing done. They turned it in and, and John Carl Beekler, the director, he was hired because of his, uh, his, his effects background. He had a good effects background. That's actually, he brought Kane Hodder in because Kane Hodder had done some stunts on another movie he'd done called prison. And so he was, he was brought in because he was a good effects guy. And obviously the design of Jason was, was his brainchild um they came up with all these great kills they were gory they were hardcore and they turn it in and the mpaa which is the the motion picture association of america that actually gives ratings to movies said you absolutely cannot release the movie the way it is right now and i've seen those outtakes as many of them as as, as have survived they're not that crazy they're good enough and they're bloody and they're crazy, but they're nothing. They're, they're not terrifier Two back in 1988, which would have been, you know, it, it would have been a banned movie back then, something like that. It wasn't anything outlandish, but it was good creative kills and lots of blood and lots of guts. The MPAA said, absolutely not. Well, when you're on this tight deadline and you got to finish cutting this movie, editing this movie, they just went, all right, make that kill less bloody. Okay, how about this? Nope, less bloody than that. Okay. They didn't question the MPAA. They were getting so bogged down with all the notes. And some of them, some of the producers, or maybe it was the director, believed that maybe the MPAA had it had it out for Friday the 13th because it had been such a successful franchise. And the MPAA is a, a board of non-elected people, random people who just decide with no with no discerning just completely subjectively decide what something is good or not or okay or not for 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 release so they kowtowed to almost every note most famously damon this is the very first time that jason gets somebody in a sleeping bag and slams them against a tree he does it multiple times after that but this is the first time he's done it originally he hit him no more than i believe i wrote it down here somewhere um shit I don't know, something like six or eight times. MPAA said, cut it down again. They cut it down again. Basically, the MPAA cut it down all the way to the single one. And so the final cut that was put into theaters had almost no blood, almost zero gore, because the MPAA didn't want any of it in there. And they couldn't, ha they didn't have the time to fight back or to reshoot things to get creatively around it so this movie actually some some fans call this friday the 13th the no blood because it's not that gory of a movie but it's it wasn't their fault they were on track to be one of the goriest and craziest movies in the series 
But because of the MPAA at the time, they just arbitrarily decided, cut out all this gore. We can't have any of this gore in your horror movie. Yeah, it's weird because I noticed it right away because that's such a staple of the franchise. And when you mentioned John Carl Beekler, the director, who also did the effects, which, by the way, the effects of this movie are really good. And you can actually find there is a supercut on YouTube. Some YouTube person years ago, I think it's like 11 years old at this point, made a Friday the 13th supercut, part seven, where they basically took the deleted footage that never made it into theaters that's on like the Blu-ray release of the movie, and they intercut it with the actual movie to show you what you should have seen. So like the death scene that's in the movie, they cut away and they go to like the, the footage that's from the deleted scenes. It doesn't look great, but they try to clean it up as much as they could. But you do see the gore. You do see the blood. You do see like the graphic nature of it. And it's like a seven-minute video. If you're a fan of that, I would just search it out. Just go search Friday the 13th Part 7 deleted scenes, and you'll see it. It's like a super cut. Uh, that I found, watched it. It was really cool. It was really, really awesome. But I was like, man, this is such a different movie when you put all that stuff in there because the gore in this movie was fantastic. Uh, and when you cut it all out, I was kind of like, what is going on here? This doesn't feel like a Friday the 13th movie. We're seeing the, a lot of cutaways, which means Jason swings the hatchet. You don't actually see it go in. Jason yeah. plunges the knife. You don't really see it go in, or you don't see it come out. You don't see any of that. Like, you just see the the aftermath, or you see the yeah. moment where it happens. It reminded me, it's a movie that I love, and I know a lot of, I know it's kind of like a controversial film amongst Halloween fans, but Halloween H2O, which was like the original Halloween 2018, when they brought it back 20 years later, Jamie Lee Curtis came back as Laurie Strode, and in that film, she's still his sister and all that kind of stuff. But it was like the scream version of Halloween. And one of the biggest complaints that I've heard and I have for that movie is I love Halloween H2O. I really do. I love that movie. My biggest complaint about that movie is, is all the cutaways. Half the good kills by Michael Myers in that movie are cutaways. They show him brandishing the knife, showing the knife. They show the aftermath a couple of times, but they only show like one or, and even like there's one really cool death scene in that movie where you see Jason plunging the knife into the person, but you don't actually see the knife go going into the person. You just hear it going yeah. up and down. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, where's the actual, like, I need some death scenes here. I need some carnage. Yeah. Um, and so that was like the first thing I noticed. Also, to John Carl Beekler's credit, because I was, I wanted to mention during this podcast that like the effects of this movie are really good. And obviously, we all know Tom Savini did the original Tom Savini's a legend. And some of the Friday the 13th movies are better and, than others when it comes to the effects. John Carl Beekler has a lot of bona fides. He actually is a super experienced special effects guy. And I didn't realize until looking him up how many movies he worked on. Let me just mention some of the movies he worked on just doing special effects. Reanimator, which is iconic. The iconic Big Stuart one. Gordon movie with the severed head that talks, iconic. Uh, he did From Beyond, which we've reviewed on this podcast many, many moons ago, which actually had really cool effects. Yeah. He did Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master, which is your favorite Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Uh, Amazing he did, effects. He did, uh, not a good movie, but he did it. He did Friday. The, he did Freddy's Dead. Uh, he did Halloween 4. And he also did uh, three movies in a series of Ghoulies, which this is close to my heart, Patrick. I love Ghoulies. Ghoulies, Ghoulies 2, 1987. Go click mm -hmm. on it because the star of Ghoulies 2 in 1987 is Damon Martin. It's not me. <laughs> That's awesome. It's not me. I actually had a person reach out to me like a year ago asking if I would do their podcast for a horror podcast. I thought they were asking me because of our show. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was the Damon Martin from Ghoulies too. I was like, no, no, I'm not. I'm not that Damon Martin. I apologize. Uh, oh, you listen I'm to our that. podcast? Thank you. Like, we don't know you had a podcast. Yeah, Who's that? Like, like, we've been we've been looking to try to track you down for years. I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, Ghoulies too. I was like, oh shit, no, not that Damon Martin. I'm the other Damon <laughs> Martin. <laughs> Ghoulies too's rad though. But yeah, he's got a lot of. So that's probably the part that disappoints me most about this movie. Yes, is because the effects were great, and I, if they would, because when I watched that super cut today i was like damn these were some awesome kills it bums me out that they're not in the movie 
It does. It really does. And I think with those in there, I think this would be hands down everyone's favorite Friday the 13th. There, I think there's no question. And I, I even recently watched Jason Takes Manhattan. It was just on and I was like, fine, I'll leave it on. And it's like super underwhelming. Like almost all the kills in there are incredibly underwhelming. Um, I would I would say the only thing that could rival it with kills, you know, Jason X, as fucking batshit as that movie is, has got some pretty awesome kills in it. But it's but no, I don't think anyone calls that their favorite Friday the Thirteenth movie. And they're being serious, or they're people who just are genuinely like uh, agent provocateurs and like only like bad movies because Jason X sucks. But if this movie had retained the kills that John Carl Beekler intended. I could almost guarantee you this would be the top of everybody's list because uh, I, I think it has everything. It has the story, it has it has what should have been great kills, and it's got the best showdown and the best the best person to go up against Jason ever. Freddy versus Jason has some pretty brutal kills too. I got to give credit there. That's some real. That, that's kills. a Freddy movie. We've re, we have determined know, that know, on the show. That Jason, is a Freddy movie. Jason, it's a great one. Jason Jason has some brutal kills in that movie though. I mean, when he fold when you oh, fold yeah. the dude, when you fold the dude up dude up in bed and break his spine in half, you're doing something pretty awesome. Oh, dude, that I I'm in awe of that movie. That's that might be my favorite Freddy movie. I know I know I love uh, Part Four, and and it really is just truly a great Freddy movie, but. Freddy vs. Jason is way up there, man. It's a fucking awesome movie. Yeah, Damon, like, if you don't have anything else before categories, do you? No, nothing else. I'd like to give you. I'd like to rifle off just a little bit of trivia for you, because this movie's got it all. Now, there's something in this movie that I loved ever since I was a kid, and that is the the beginning of this movie is actually a, a like an overview of what's happened in the last six movies. I love that. And it was so memorable as a kid to just see snippets of all the movies that have come before leading up to the new blood. Well, there's a great narrator during that time. Do you know who the narrator is, Damon? I don't. The narrator is none other than Walt, none other than Walt Gorney. And if you're like, who the fuck is Walt Gorney? It's crazy Ralph. <laughs> crazy Ralph from the original Friday the 13th is the narrator and b believe me my whole life i've always th 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 this ringing in my ears is he's still down there i fucking love that little intro and i never knew it was crazy ralph until this podcast doing the research for this podcast that's walt gorney from parts one and two he narrates the opening of this film and this is the last time he ever performed as an actor Wow, it's like learning that John Larroquette did the intro for Texas Chainsaw Massacre back in the day. It's up there <laughs> for guys like me. But I mean, Crazy Ralph has always been like, like for, for hardcore uh, Friday the 13th fans, we all love Crazy Ralph. I did not realize that was literally Crazy Ralph doing that intro, and I fucking love that. And that intro um, is good too, by the way. That intro is a good great. intro. Like, it's really well done. I should have just read that at the beginning instead of my long diatribe that took 20 times to fucking do. <laughs> <laughs> um the mask in this movie was cast from the original mask from part three so you are looking at the exact same mask that was introduced for the first time in part three the only difference is obviously it was heavily modified because john carl beekler very wisely envisioned that the mask had all the damage that had been accumulated over the last six films i love that i love that but i love the fact that the, it is indeed because there have been times when you can tell they just used a totally different mask he said where's the original mask make a cast of it and let's and let's put a tons of character all over this mask um another part is the actor who played jason in part six was slated to reprise reprise the role for part seven but john carbeekler wanted kane hotter after working with him in prison because during a scene where um where kane hotter's character raises up out of the the uh the this basement or cistern or something uh, he's supposed to be kind of like a rotting zombie kind of guy. And as he was doing that, he goes, Hey, uh, John, what if in this scene, we just put a bunch of worms in my mouth. And as I appear out of the ground, like the worms are coming out of my mouth. John Carl Beekler said, that's a guy who's dedicated. That's a guy who needs to be Jason because he will go to any length to make it happen. So we were going to see the guy from part six continue on, but instead Kane Hodder got it because he was willing to put worms in his mouth. 
And then um, this is the longest that Jason has ever appeared unmasked in the entire series. Now, during that great showdown that we're going to talk a little bit more about in the categories, uh, Tina snaps his mask off and then you see this incredible effects that still look great today. That's the longest you will ever see Jason unmasked in any of the movies. The director claims that Jason sat inert in the lake for 10 years. Now, I did mention that earlier. And that's <laughs> somebody needs to talk to them about the timeline, Damon, because I don't think that makes a lick of sense. That would put this movie somewhere in the 90s. And there's no chance that that's the case. Um, the original title of this film was Jason's Destroyer because it was about Tina. It was about the only person who could actually kill him. Uh, I still think the New Blood's a better title, but Jason's Destroyer is pretty cool. It just sounds more like it belongs in the Conan series than than here in Friday the 13th. <laughs> this sounds film's... Like, it's a, it sounds like a monster truck, Jason's Destroyer. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can go in on a monster truck and call it Jason's Destroyer. Uh, this film set the record for the longest on-screen controlled burn at 40 seconds. And we all know Kane Hodder is a tried-and-true stunt person. And he, he set the record for the longest on-screen burn, 40 seconds. Uh, it's, it doesn't sound that long, but if you, try jumping rope for 40 seconds and, and then telling me that being on fire for 40 seconds isn't a long time. In the original cut of the sleeping bag scene, Jason whacked his victim six times against the tree as opposed to the single shot that we see in the final film. Now, John Carl Beekler, despite the fact that the MPAA gave him a lot of shit for that scene, admits that they in a rare case we're probably right he says he actually likes that this the single impact now as opposed to the multiple ones where it's kane hotter basically beating bags of blood against a, a a tree what do you think damon do you like the six multiple ones where it turns into a bloody pulp or do you like that one single snap and she's dead i like the six multiple bangs against the tree it was so much more brutal and the blood <sighs> in the bag was so, so bloody better. And that's that's an amazing one. So I would argue the six, like when he just continues to bash her against a tree, much more effective in my eyes. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. I, I there was something so disturbing about the first time I saw him beat that bag to the point that it was just a bloody floppy mess. I thought it was really cool. But that's it. That's just a little bit of a little bit of trivia for my favorite Friday the Thirteenth film. Yeah, I agree. New Blood is a better title, but Jason's Destroyer would be a good monster truck. I'm just saying, like, it would be a good, you know. Maybe I'll get Jason's Destroyer tattooed on me somewhere. Yeah, that's a good title. <laughs> I just don't know if it's a good title because you kind of, you kind of, you're kind of burying the lead there for your movie when you're like, here's Jason's Destroyer. Like, uh, uh, so does Jason lose? Well, we know he's eventually going to lose, but like, you don't have to tell him yeah. the title. You know, so. Yeah, it wouldn't be my first pick for a title, but it's it's it sounds cool. The words sound cool, but I don't think they make it. They they don't make a good title. Friday the Thirteenth Part Six: Jason Drowns. Hold on now. You just told us <laughs> whoa, 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 movie whoa! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> told us how the movie is there, dude. What's going on here? Uh, <laughs> all right, let's get into categories. We got a lot of them for this movie because they couldn't. This is this is your favorite Friday the Thirteenth movie, so we got a lot of uh, categories. Let's kick things off as we do each and every week here on the show. Let's talk about best performance because you know it's a horror movie. It's a Friday the Thirteenth movie. The uh, the acting is hit or miss. Let's be honest. But uh, mm -hmm. what is your what is your best performance in uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven? Jason's destroy. I mean, New Blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I was getting a little nervous when it was time to do categories because I thought to myself, this is 1988. There isn't much out there for a best performance. Even an Oscar winner at the, in 1988 wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire. Imagine what a, what a, what a low budget slasher would, would, uh, would bring out. But I, I really realized it, 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 it's such for me and it is because Kane Hodder is Jason. He's best. He brought character to this, to this, to this icon. We've talked a lot uh, in one through four. We talk about kind of the listlessness of Jason. You know, you talk about well, in one, he's like a teenage boy uh, in a, in a in a lake. In two, he's a, just some little guy with a pitchfork and a bag over his head. Not that intimidating. And in three, he was like the most nonplussed, hulking animal of a man he just didn't care to be there and it showed in his body language um 
Kane Hodder, you know it's him behind all of that. And and that should not work. You should be like, no, it's just Jason. But it's the way his chest heaves. It's the way he turns his head and then turns his body to go. And and they brought I was I was watching some of the behind the scenes on this and they were talking about his performance. And this was something that hadn't struck me before, but he moves with purpose in this movie. In the other movies, it almost seems like you just kind of run into Jason and then he kills you or he sneaks up on you. You don't even see how he got to you and he kills you. In this one, he is barreling towards you. He's charging after you. He's angry. You actually feel anger coming from him. Like, I'm going to kill you, motherfucker. Is very much what it feels like when Jason is 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 charging after people in this movie. I mean, to me, it's a it's it's a no brainer. It's Kane Hodder. Yeah, Kane Hodder is really good in this one, and um, I mean, there's a reason why, even though he doesn't make his first appearance as Jason until part seven. But if you talk to any hardcore horror fan or any Friday the 13th fan, when they talk about who is the definitive Jason, it's always Kane Hodder, which is funny because he's not even in the majority of the franchise. Uh, you know what I mean? He's in, you would, you could argue he's actually in the worst part of the franchise after this one, because <laughs> Jason takes Manhattan and Jason X are both bad. And Fred, and was he also Jason in, uh, in Jason goes to hell? Was he in that he one? He was too? Jason yeah. and Jason goes to hell as well. Which is also a really bad movie. Uh, you could argue Kane gets the worst end of it because he's actually in the really bad Friday the 13th movies. Uh, and then they didn't bring him back for Freddy versus Jason. They replaced him with Ken Kersinger. So, uh, yeah, it's weird. He's only in like one really good Friday the 13th movie, yet his performance is so definitive when you talk to anybody and they say, who is Jason? They say Kane Hodder. It's a weird one. Uh, and I think that's all based upon his performance. And then when you're a silent, just hulking killer, you have to do something in your physical action to sell it. And he does it. He does it really, really well. And also credit to John Carl Beekler because the effects on Jason in this movie are the best of any of the Friday films, in my opinion. Yeah. It made him look monstrous, as I said earlier in the show. And it was really the first time that I remember watching a Jason film and being like, Jason looks scary you know what i mean like mm -hmm. obviously a, a six foot five dude carrying an axe with a, with a hockey mask is intimidating yes and scary <laughs> but like just the look of him with like the gross decaying skin and the skin peeling off his fingers and his whole body was he was wet throughout the entire movie like never, <laughs> yeah i know he never, he never dried out from that lake man that's 10 years worth of lake water just <laughs> seeping out of his pores um that was effective. He looked great. So yeah, Kane Hodder is incredible in this movie. And and when you always talked about him and like you always for years, like on and off the air, you talked about how much Kane Hodder was the best Jason. And I knew from every fan that he was the best Jason. But again, I'm not as attached to this series. Rewatching this one and getting ready for the podcast is like now I kind of get it. Like now I get yeah. it. His performance in this movie really sells it. Um it's it's just really strong. Yeah, absolutely. So now for me, best performance, I could have easily gone Kane Hodder. And uh, I think I would have been completely okay with that. But I'm actually going to give credit where credit's due to Laura Park Lincoln as Tina. I think she did a really good job selling herself as like the tra traumatized, damaged teenager struggling to cope with the powers and the, ac the, 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 re the actions that she's taken in her life. I thought she did a really good job. And I, and I say this with all reverence to the career she put together because watching this movie, and I've said this about other actors before, and I want to be clear when I say this, I'm not insulting what they did after a movie. I'm just saying that, like, I think she's super talented, and mm -hmm. I'm actually kind of surprised she didn't go on to do more. Now, again, I don't want to, I'm not saying she's not happy with her career. I'm not saying that this wasn't her choice. This may have been exactly what she wanted. She wanted to do this movie and had the exact career that she had after this movie. I'm not insulting what she's done. I'm just saying that, like, seeing this movie this is another case where it's like when you see patricia arquette in nightmare on Elm street 3 you see little bits and pieces of the actor who will go on to become an academy award-winning actor right or academy nominated actor because patricia arquette is fantastic 
you see elements of that. Even Lawrence Fishburne in that movie, you see elements. I'm not saying they're as good then as they eventually become, but you see right. little elements of like that's a star. You see it. I th- I thought that for Laura Park Lincoln. I'm not saying she would have gone on to become Meryl Streep, but I'm just saying like she was good and she played emotion really well. And I think emotion, especially when you're crying and things like that, that's some of the hardest things to do as an actor because if you don't do it right, man, it looks really bad. And she does a great job to that point. I got to give a little criticism here, though, Patrick. We don't do worst performance anymore. We dropped that category a long time ago. But can I mention one scene that stood out in this movie that I was like, <laughs> boy, that was bad. So Terry Kaiser is the most, is it Terry Kaiser? Am I getting the name right? Yeah. Terry Kaiser is the most experienced guy on here. He was the guy who had the biggest career before and arguably after this, of course, being weakened at Bernie's guy. Uh, playing a dead man really worked out well for him. <laughs> His death scene, when he gets stabbed by the lawn, the, by the uh, weed whacker, he does the cross-eyed dead scene. Did you notice that? It is <laughs> yes. so bad. Oh, yeah. It is so bad. He does the full-on like, cross-eyed where he's like, ooh, I'm dead. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, like. <laughs> he has the he has the worst death, death face I've seen. I was like, good Lord, dude. Like, you need to work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is- Listen, this was 88, man. Everybody was giving 88 performances at the time. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, you, you talk about Lar- – oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just say the death face got me, but yes. Yeah, yeah listen, he, he wasn't my favorite part of the movie, if I'm wholly honest with you. Um, but you talk about Lar Park Lincoln. That was – she was – her her performance as – Tina made my favorite character for the for our next category. Favorite character for me was Tina, and it is because of all the things that I said earlier. She is my final girl, but not only that, is she is the best final girl that the Friday the 13th series has ever had. There's no doubt about it. It's a shame that um, this movie didn't end up uh, sequelizing her, which, which was John Carl Beekler's plan. Uh, the sequel to this would have been um, Tina being locked up and being accused of the murders of everybody at Crystal Lake that night. Um, and she's she's locked up in a mental asylum and Jason comes after her there and, and, and kills his way through the mental asylum to get to Tina. How fucking great of a fucking sequel would that have been? What, I'm like excited hearing about it now. I'm like, that's pretty awesome. It's, I want to see that. It's, I want that movie so damn bad. The, the the rights issues with these movies are they're tiring genuinely genuinely like not worth talking about but lar park lincoln's tina is the most iconic final girl in this series it's not even close yeah my favorite character is also tina um she was great and and her torment at the hands of dr bernie and and just the trauma she dealt with with her dad and then seeing her being once again the the one who believes that jason's out there no one believes her and you know just her her entire character and then the way she gains strength it it does like that you talk about the carrie like powers like it reminds you a little bit of carrie when she finally realizes her full strength when Carrie, you know, tears down the high school in, in her part, which is, you know, she's being traumatized by her fellow students. And this one, like, she just finally snaps and, like, after her mom's dead and she's just like, okay, all right, it's time to unleash my full powers. And she goes after Jason. It's like the first time Jason is, uh, he's not, but it's like the first time Jason would be scared. You know, like yeah. someone's coming after him that's as powerful as he is or more powerful than he is. And Tina really does that. So, yeah, like, I'm with you, man. You telling me that for the sequel? I want that. Why don't they make that movie now? Put her back in an asylum like 30 years later, and then he just resurrects and comes after. I'd watch that movie today. I don't want. Yeah, I know. Honestly, you could do the full Halloween 2018 thing and just go, let's skip everything that, is, <laughs> that has happened in Friday the 13th since the new blood and just cut to Tina in, an, in an, a mental asylum, whatever this is, 30 something years later, and Jason's coming back for her. Like it, you don't need to fuck around with anything else. Like just do that or do a full reboot where Tina is the central focus of, of the story in, in part one, which is basically a reboot of the new blood. Part two is the, uh, the mental asylum. And then part three is whatever you want to do with it or just just make it two. Fuck, you don't need to make three. Make it a two two story arc. Uh, you don't have everything doesn't have to go in threes. But 
listen, man, this is a, this is as good as Friday the 13th got in terms of storylines. It's, it's it's hands down where it should have been. Yeah, it is. It, like I said, and Tina was a good character. Um, let's talk about best kill and let me go ahead and bury the lead here because I wanted to come up like I always try to pick differently. I didn't pick differently, Patrick. It's the same kill because it's the best kill. It is. It really is. Listen, the sleeping bag scene is so iconic that it's it's appeared no less than two more times in the series. And I'm, I may be getting it wrong. It may be three more times, but I'm pretty sure it's just it appears again in Jason X, if I'm not mistaken. And then it appears again in the reboot, if I'm not mistaken. And it's kind of modified in the reboot where I think he uh, he hangs her over a fire. But it's actually the best kill in that in the reboot at by, by far. But that sleeping bag is so important. And it started here in this in this uh, in this installment. Yeah, the sleeping bag kill. So I I knew the sleeping bag kill. I didn't remember it started in this movie. That's how iconic it became because like I remembered the sleeping bag kill, but I had forgotten it was in part seven. And when he did in part yeah. seven, he grabs the girl and he starts chucking her against the the the, the tree. I was like, that's awesome. And then rewatching the deleted scenes. To see he did it like six times, I was like, even better. Like, it's just a, it's such a, you know, you you love the creative kills in Friday the Thirteenth. I I I enjoy them, but like, I'm not ever totally blown away by them. This one was one where I was like blown away. That was a cool way to do it. To literally zip her up in the in the sleeper bag and just fucking bash her against a tree. I was like, that's pretty badass. And it really does accentuate the brutality that Jason can inflict on somebody. It's a full grown person in a sleeping bag and, and credit to Kane Hodder at the time. I don't know. I don't know how old he was exactly at the time, but he wraps a person up in a sleeping bag and drags them over. You know what I mean? It's just fucking terrifying. It's like, Jesus Christ, like this thing is a brute. This thing is an absolute monster. And then of course, for the swinging scene, he's not swinging a person. He's swinging a couple of bags of blood, but he even said, he goes, those were fucking heavy bags. <laughs> they're like, they're, yeah. they're, you know, gallons of blood that he's having to swing, but Kane Hodder could embody it. He was a, he's a physically super strong guy and could pick that bag up and slam it against a tree that just sells that brutality and that creative way that kills happen. Do you happen to know how tall Kane Hodder is? It's it's obscured, but I want to say he's not the tallest. I want to say he's around six one, six two. Okay, I, I've seen yeah. him at conventions, but I've never like stood next. I'm six three, so I've never stood next to him. I usually when I see him, he's sitting down at conventions. So I've always been curious because he does have a real imposing nature to him. Um, you know what I mean? And he looks. I mean, obviously you can. I mean, they make Tom Cruise look tall on screen. He's like five two. Um, you can do that through trickery with camera and things like that. So I, but I was always curious, like, cause I know he's a big guy, but I never knew yeah. exactly how tall he was. Yeah. I want to say he's around six, two. I could be wrong. And Kane, if I am wrong, don't choke me out. Um, but I, yeah, I think he's around six, one, six, two, which, which would be significantly shorter than Ken Kersinger, which I think Ken comes in around six, six. Yeah. And he's massive. Like when he shows yeah, up, big, like, big guy, Jason, he's a big dude. Um, and not the first time Ken has shown up in the series, by the way. Ken was the short order cook who fights Kane Hodder in Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh wow, I forgot <laughs> about that. You're right. I do remember. I think I, you, I think you told me that before. I think I may have told you that. Yeah. I may have told you on the podcast. I can't remember, but I think it was yeah. Freddy versus Jason. I think that's when you told me that. That's right. I do remember that now. Yeah, K K Kane Hodder and Ken Kersinger have thrown down before, and in that one, Kane got the better of him. There you go. There you go. Now, once again, I'm burying the lead because the best deleted kill, which I want you to talk about, is the best. It, when I okay, let me just tell you real quick. <laughs> when I watched the deleted scenes and I watched that supercut, I keep referencing on YouTube. When it was over, I almost texted you like, "Fuck the MPAA," because that kill, this kill you're about to talk about was the best it my honestly patrick i'm being completely serious i've seen all these movies i'm not gonna declare it but i'm gonna say it's, it, it probably is the deleted scene we're about to talk about might be my favorite kill in the entire friday the 13th franchise it's badass yes and this this is one of those the tragedy of this kill being deleted from the movie it, I don't know if it would. I would make it my number one because I think the sleeping bag's really iconic. People absolutely adore the frozen face smash from X, 
they like I've I've heard more people mention that kill over anything else other than the sleeping bag. But this is no doubt a top three or if not, if not a number one, especially had I seen it properly done, properly presented cinematically the way they chose to do. And that was Ben's kill. Now in the movie, in the final cut of the movie that everybody sees, um, Ben's outside and he's having some fun with his girlfriend in the van. And he goes out because he thinks his buddies finally showed up for the surprise party. Instead, he runs into Jason and Jason grabs him by the head and just kind of gets him into this like headlock. And he just kind of starts to squeeze him, in, and you hear the guy struggle, and then then he just falls to the floor. And you're like, okay, I guess he kind of cracked his head or, or something. You, you don't really know what happened. The best deleted kill was this scene. In that, John Carl Buechler rigged a head that was exactly like Ben's head that was able to squeeze like like a king cotter kane hotter could squeeze it down to what beekler calls the size of a walnut and you watch all this blood start spraying out of ben's face eyeballs popping blood spurting i mean like tarantino levels of arterial spray as this cranium is getting crushed by kane hotter's hands down to just it something that fits in his hand it was fuck. It was an insane kill. It was an absolutely insane kill. It left. It's they left it on the cutting room floor because of the MPAA. Hands down, the best deleted kill out there. W- amongst a few good ones too, by the way. All the other kills in the movie had way more gore in them, and they were just cut down. But that one, that was just extra special. Yeah, that one. That one was like he was juicing a head. He was literally mm-hmm. juicing a head. He's squeezing it down, and the blood is the juice. Like it was so gory and so cool. And unique. I had never seen that before. Like, I had never seen anything where he literally just grabs the guy by the top and bottom of his head and just compacts him. And you see yeah. everything go flying. I was like, yeah. I was angry getting done with the, the thing because I was like, this is so much better. Like, if you would have actually included all this, this was so much better. Oh, it would have been way better. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on to best gore. And I'm can I, can I go first here and cheat? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. I'm cheating here because I'm going with best gore from a del- from the deleted scenes. Oh, you there's, cheater! There's no gore in the movie. <laughs> well, there um, is. It's in my pick. <laughs> it's in very. It's very rarely. So I was gonna go with the head kill, but the head kill in the deleted scene is is the best deleted kill. But I'm gonna go with because here's and this is why it makes me angry that they cut all this when Doctor Cruz gets the lawn the uh weed whacker what the weed eater to the i, don't, I yeah. guess it's a weed eater right yeah it was a weed whacker yeah the blade, the blade the blade straight to his gut and they show it for a split second and then you see his goofy cross-eyed death face <laughs> they cut in to his the, face the, instead of the gore <laughs> in the deleted scene they show him literally gnawing through his intestines and blood flying and his insides just getting turned into outsides and then you see the goofy death face <laughs> I love that because that is a really cool implement of a different kind of weapon for Jason than a hatchet or a, or a, a machete or whatever. Using he literally you see him zip it, you're going. Nee! <laughs> he just yeah. goes in and buzz saws this dude's insides. And the one in the movie's okay. Like they show it for like a split second, and then you see the oh, barely. Face. But the deleted scene is so awesome. Like again, the the. The the can crusher head is the best, but this one is pretty gnarly. And also because you kind of want Dr. Cruz to get his comeuppance. You want this guy to die. You're yeah. kind of like, this guy's an ass. You want him to die. I really love that. So yes, I am cheating, but it's also because it was a really cool scene. And that one, even more than the head crushing scene, the head crushing scene didn't make me as mad watching it because I thought maybe in the moment like he broke his neck is what I actually thought in the movie because like right you yeah you're struggling. not confused or anything you, you, well you hear him struggling and he drops him so I was like oh he must have broken his neck I didn't have any idea he actually crushed his head because they literally just cut all that out in Doctor Cruz's death you know he's stabbing him with a running blade and you don't see it I'm like what the yeah. hell so that's why the delete that's why that one's my favorite because in the deleted scene when you see the gore it's awesome. Yeah, when when the blade hits his stomach, like his guts kind of pop out and they end up wrapping around the blade a little bit like it was just kind of a happy accident in the moment. It it was a really great bit of gore that, of course, got left on the cutting room floor, unfortunately. 
Um, mine, my pick was from something that did actually end up on the final cut of the film and, um, that's Axe Face. And so, uh, there's, there's a couple out by the lake. Uh, I think the girl goes skinny dipping and the guy's kind of hanging out on the, on the, uh, at the edge of the lake. He's about to get in, but instead he ends up getting an ax to the face and he falls over. Now, when his girlfriend looks back, she sees the aftermath and that's the only real, bit of gore outside of what I would say Jason himself, who is, is rather gory in this movie, just looking at him unmasked. Um, that's the only other piece of like explicit gore when she looks back at him and you can see the big wound where the ax was. It's about as good as it got for the, for the actual cut of the film. Yeah. That you, you do see it there. Also I want to mention one other thing. This is kind of off subject. Uh, is it Monica? Is that her name? The one girl that like snoyed is, is the snooty girl who wants to get the lead character. I think it's Melissa. Melissa. Okay. When yeah. they go back, when, when Tina and, and the dude go back to the house and, and Melissa's like, she doesn't believe Jason's real. She doesn't believe Jason's real. And she opens the yeah. door and Jason's there and he raises up the ax to kill her. And, and then he chucks her over the TV. That, image of jason with the axe in that moment i was like oh that's like one of the most iconic images of jason you see out on the internet when you search jason Voorhees. that's one of the most famous ones with him with that axe held high right before he yeah. hits her and i didn't remember it came from this movie i was like oh that's from this movie because that is like one of the most iconic images of jason with the axe yeah. held up over his head about to hit her and you, when you pause the movie, you can see exactly where the image is from. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I had no idea that I had no memory. That's where it was from. I just thought it was cool because, like, when you search it online, I'd say eight out of ten times, that's probably the image you see. Yeah, he's kind of rearing up. You know, he's like, he's a little almost three quarter. You see a little bit of the the mask cut away and a little bit of the teeth and the and the, the arm up ready to to lay an axe right into Melissa's face. Another great bit of gore that got cut because they actually got a shot of an axe going into the fake head and 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 gore and the gore aftermath of all that. It's a real shame. I, I think this would this would have been one of the most beloved horror films of the late eighties had had stuff like that stayed in. Yeah, so let's move on to our next category, which is best psychic move. And no, we're not talking about Miss Cleo. We are talking. Oh, about come on now. <laughs> we are <laughs> talking about Tina using her powers of telekinesis, and she uses a lot of. Now, I will say, pissing with the gasoline can was interesting, uh, but I wouldn't say it's my favorite. Patrick, what is your favorite telekinesis? The favorite psychic move in uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. I really loved them all, including the pissing gasoline, which is goofy as hell. But it also sort of reminded me of Nightmare on Elm Street a little bit. Like it kind of had that vibe to it. So I appreciate it on that level. But my favorite one for this was uh, what I what I dubbed Hang em High. And what she does is uh, she, she's having this great showdown with Jason in the house. And, um, you know, she doesn't really know what to do, but she bursts this light over his head. First of all, that's just a great, cool effect in slow-mo. And the wire comes out of the top of the ceiling and wraps around his neck and then yanks him up into the sky. And he's like grabbing at his own neck and kicking and moving all around. And then it, it eventually breaks and he like falls through. It's such a great overall stunt, but it came from her first, like trying to just strangle him to death with a piece of electrical cord. Also, can I mention... You know, like we talk about like the epic showdown. When I really think about it, like Tina kind of kicks his ass. Like Jason really yes. does, like, he, Jason kills everyone around her, but she she kind of kicks his ass. I'm just saying, like Jason that, that was a 10-7 round if, if I'm being honest. Like, that's a <laughs> full on like that's a full on ass kicking right there. I'm just saying. Um Yeah, the fight wasn't close. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like Jason had no hope. He just got his ass kicked. Um which is why he should come back and get her in the asylum in the sequel that we're going to write. Um, uh, totally. Um, my favorite psychic move, which I, I had to, I had to, that's part of the reason I rewatched it again. Cause I wanted to remember all the different psychic moves. Um, I love my favorite, which I like, I like all of them. All of them are creative. I like the fact that she uses the, the wire to electrocute him. I like that she uses the light switch, the, the light fixture to come down, swing him, hit him in the head. All of them are cool. But my favorite and the one that I thought was the most creative was when she tightens the strap on the back mm. of his hockey mask and it bursts the hockey mask and it breaks. And that's when you see the zombie grossed out Jason face. 
I yeah. thought that was so cool that she like thought to like sh- like tighten it on his face and like basically crank his face and the mask breaks. And I just yeah. I love that image because I'm like, oh shit, she's like basically trying to crush his head like a vice and the, the the mask breaks, but it's just a really cool twist of like how she uses her powers. And it's also one reason I love it, Patrick, is because it's subtle. Like yeah. it's not it's not swinging lamps or even the wire coming down which is again very cool even the gasoline which i kind of make fun of but it's actually kind of a cool trick but the the idea that she just tightens the mask and it breaks i was like "Ooh, that's that's really cool you're actually spot on about that like i almost want to take back my like it is really it is really amazing and it's a it's a it's a it's a moment that i think about over and over and over again just that idea that she's like maybe i can crush his head by just squeezing the mask around his head and and like you see little bits of gore and brain kind of seeping out of the sides of it you're like oh shit she's gonna fucking crush his head but then the mask explodes and then it's a it's such an iconic scene when the mask explodes and he swings around and you get the full reveal of his zombie face and you're like whoa okay (laughs) that guy has had one too many fights in his day he looks a little rough um no, no that's a great one dude good pull yeah, that's my favorite one. I just like it's just so subtle and such a cool like, oh man, that's really cool. So, um Yeah. What is the best stunt in this movie? Because there are a lot, you know, th- this is a pretty action heavy movie, especially when you get into the last 45 minutes. So, what what is your best stunt in uh Friday the 13th Part 7? I have tried desperately every time that we've done a Friday the 13th review to add a, a stunts in it because I do think it is one of those things on top of the creative kills that defines this particular franchise is stunts. So you get people flying through, you know, two story windows and, and people getting hit by cars and people getting hung up high and all these crazy shits. Um, and I thought I was going to give it to Jason cause he's got a ton of fucking great stunts. We already mentioned the record long burn. I gave it this one to Melissa. Okay. So she's the bitchy one. She's the one that's kind of bullying Tina from, from the top. And if anyone, even over Dr. Cruz, you, you kind of want her to get fucked up more than anything. She's just unnecessarily shitty to Tina. Well, despite the fact that they cut away from all the great gore of Jason, just laying an ax into the middle of her face, he does a second thing. He grabs, he grabs her after putting a, an ax in her face and just chucks her across the room and they cut to her fly. And this was an actual stunt person. I looked this up. <laughs> they chucked an actual stunt person who like slams against the wall and then disappears behind the TV. And it just looked so gnarly. I was like, somebody really did that. They really threw a person against that wall and they just, just disappeared behind a television. It reminded me a little bit of, uh, of Terminator when, uh, when, um, Oh God, what's his name? Rick Rothschild. Remember Rick Rothschild from the eighties? He plays the boyfriend who fights yeah. Arnold in the bedroom yes. and he gets chucked over the, he gets chucked over the, yeah. the mattress and everything kind of reminded me of that. Like they just beat the shit out. Is it Rick Rothschild? I remember his name correctly. I don't remember. Uh, his name. I just know he was the guy from top gun. He was one of the yeah. top gun pilots. I want to say it's Rick Rothschild is his name, but yeah, when, when Arnold beats the shit out of him and chucks him over something it reminded me of that, except he's in his underwear at the time. Uh, he's in his tidy whities when he gets chucked yeah. over the thing. But yeah. And he's also a big buff dude. And this was, this was like yeah. a, like a 98 pound little blonde girl that just goes flying across the room. Yeah. So now my best stunt is also kind of my worst stunt. And I want to highlight this because when we talked about part four, I think it was part four. Yeah, it's part four. Uh, the one with Crispin Glover in it. Um, yes. When he kills the one twin and chucks her out the window and she crashes onto the ground and dies before he kills her twin later. That's a pretty cool effect. Jason loves to throw people. It's pretty much the, mm-hmm. the moniker. I rewatched this one. When he kills the one girl, he kills, kills the boyfriend in the, in the kitchen with the knife. And then he goes upstairs and attacks her and he chucks the head at her he he literally lops off the boyfriend's head and in the deleted scenes which again i keep referencing those i'm sorry he literally chucks the the severed head at her because in this one in the movie he she finds it right in this deleted scenes he literally throws it at her he's like here your boyfriend's gonna give you some head bitch and he throws (laughs) the head at her and she's like oh my god and then in the in the deleted scenes he slashes her with the hat with the uh machete and then he chucks her out the window now in the the regular version he just chucks her out the window 
But yeah. I like a good window toss. So I give it that one because when she goes to the window, it's really cool. Where I say it's also the worst, though, is there's a really bad cutaway in that scene where she falls to the ground where you can literally tell she's falling like a foot. That's oh, yeah. like going through the window, really cool. When she smashes through the window, I like that effect. That's a really cool one because she goes yeah. through the window. But when she falls, like rewatch the movie, when you see her fall to the ground, you can literally tell she's falling like a foot. And she's like... <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, yeah, could totally. you not have like, could you not have like had her jump a little further? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a rehash, and I believe it was the one from Part Four, where, where the is. girl gets chucked, with the twin gets chucked through the window. That one, they put a camera like up over like roof height, looking uh-huh. down as the stunt person jumps and then slams into the hood of a car. Like it yeah. looks, and it looks so gnarly. Could be, it looks gnarly because somebody actually was thrown on the hood of a car, and it looks ter- It looks like a terribly painful impact. This has the exact opposite of that feeling. Can I? It also, looks like she just tripped softly into some dirt. Yeah. Can I also throw out one other thing about this that I just? This is not about this movie in particular. This is in general with the Friday the Thirteenth movies, because he does chuck a lot of people from windows in this movie. Listen, I'm not saying you wouldn't get hurt, but a second story window, I mean, unless you fall on your head, you're going to survive. Like, it's two stories. Like, (laughs) I'm not saying you're not going to get hurt. You'll absolutely get hurt. Depending on where you land or how you land, you may break your back. You may break a leg. You may break. Oh, yeah. It could be devastating. Yes. Yeah. But generally speaking, just falling out of a second story window, unless you're literally falling headfirst into concrete, you're probably going to make it. Just saying, like, logistically, <laughs> physics-wise, throw her from a little higher, like, throw her at the top of the book. Somebody in one of these movies fell off the top of a barn. That yeah. I could see. That was a little taller up. But, like, everyone falls out of a second-story window in these movies, and I'm like, I mean, yeah, you'd get fucked up a little bit, but you wouldn't die. I mean, you'd, you'd be hurt. You might have a b- broken back or broken leg, but, like, she, she literally lands face down, and she's just dead. <laughs> Damon. 1988 that's all i'm gonna say like I'm don't don't saying, overthink like, I'm, it i'm not i'm just saying like you know <laughs> come on like you know like you could you could like it'd be funny if somebody did like a ninja roll and, like i made it jason <laughs> i made it ah shit and i rolled my ankle on this on this doorstep yeah but wouldn't it be cool you know it'd be cool if we ever get to make a friday the 13th sequel which you know now that we're talking about it, i feel like we need to Somebody yeah, I got ideas. Get, somebody needs to get chucked out of a second story window. They do the roll and they survive. Like they kind of hurt themselves. They're like, oh, I'm okay. I'm alive. I'm okay. And then Jason just comes out and fucking spears him to the face. I'm like, <laughs> That's great. I kind of finish the work. Like, oh my God, he survived the throw of the second story. And then he just gets like a spear to the face. I think that's fantastic. That's subversion right there. That's what you want. Also, can I mention Jason is also really, really good with aiming, throwing objects. Because he throws a knife in this movie. The first kill, when he kills Michael, he chucks a knife at Michael, and he goes right through his chest. I'm like, dude, you got some aim, man. You need to go, <laughs> you don't need to go like knife throwing classes. Jason's got that shit down. Uh, he's fully undead at this point. There's no reason that he shouldn't be perfect at every in, at every single kill. He's got like he's a like sniper aim though. He does it in part three too when he throws the arrow thing and it goes that's right, right. And he's like 30 yards away i'm like damn this could have been an nfl quarterback he hit a moving target from that far away right in the bullseye quite literally i'm just saying like dude he's got an arm on him he could be playing for he could be playing for the cowboys right now i'm just saying like he, there's wow. a reason he's my guy man i'm telling you yeah. all right now this is here here's where we're going to get into it patrick we're going to get into it now this is the seventh film in the Friday the 13th franchise. I feel like you were setting us up for an argument here because you said, what is the best seventh film in the big four? Now let me name them. So everyone knows what we're talking about. The seventh overall film, not, you know, number seven, the seventh overall film in the big four, the big four, we're talking about Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm street, Halloween and Texas Chainsaw. Texas Chainsaw. So, for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it is Texas Chainsaw 3D. <laughs> which, which, for those of you that don't remember this movie. Do your thing, cuz. 
Alexander Daddario <laughs> in her when her when her most iconic role. Do your thing, cuz. Oh, she uh, says she still gets people <laughs> saying that to her. <laughs> Uh, for Halloween, it's Halloween H2O, which I swear to God, I had no intention of mentioning it earlier in the podcast that that actually is the seventh film. Yeah, I mean, Halloween. you mentioned H2O, I would say once every six podcasts minimum. Yeah, yeah, I like that, that movie. Uh, obviously, Friday the 13th is New Blood. And then for Nightmare on Elm Street, it is New Nightmare. Wes Craven's New Nightmare. What is the best seventh film? Are we ranking them or are we just doing the best one? <sighs> I'm going to go just the best one because I'm right. ranking them silly. I mean, like, you know, I, 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 I watch all these movies for completely different reasons. So like one doesn't need to be better than the other, but let's just talk like full blown, like execution, entertainment, delivering on the premise of the franchise, which one's the best one. So you're probably going to think I'm going to go for H2O because I do love H2O, and I think that's a very underrated film. But for me, the best seventh film in those franchises is by far Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And that's not me as, like, the, the nightmare guy. Yes, I am the nightmare guy uh, with the Freddy versus Jason stand-up. You can see behind me now. I actually have that in my collection now. Um, I think that is the best one because it really reinvented what a horror, what a what a slasher film could be. The meta, uh, the meta approach of Wes Craven using real people playing themselves, like meta versions of themselves. You had Heather Langenkamp playing Heather Langenkamp. You had Wes Craven as Wes Craven. You had Robert England as Robert England. It was such a unique and different way to get into that story. Uh, that I loved it, and it still holds up as one of my favorite Nightmare films to this day. We reviewed it, of course, when we did our Nightmare franchise films. Um, I just, again, to me, that reinvented what it meant to be a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It was such a cool, unique take on that franchise and such a different twist after two legitimately bad films with Dream Child and, and Freddy's Dead. Yeah, boy. New, new Nightmare was so cool, so unique, and really, it's, it's, I mean, people have done the meta story since then, but nothing was ever quite like that in the way that Wes Craven tackled it. So for me, it's New Nightmare. And, you know, I think New Nightmare is, is very good. And the, it, a, a big thing about New Nightmare, too, is it's just so inventive. Typic, typical Wes Craven to just reinvent his own invention and go, what if, what if it was meta? What if the actors knew that they were in the movie? It's so super clever and so interesting. However, I think it diverts too far from what I really love about Nightmare on Elm Street. It, it's a different kind of movie. It was it was actually talk heavy uh, when I when I first watched it. That kind of threw me off. I was like, oh, I didn't realize like how how much of this is like discussions and things going on that aren't quite Nightmare on Elm Street. Like that's kind of what I was looking for. Um, Freddy's a little bit different in it for good and for bad. You know, like. Again, I think this is a great movie. It could have easily been my number one, but it's not. Texas Chainsaw 3D, also not, for the reasons. <laughs> Go listen to the review of that podcast if you want to know why. It's just, holy shit. I can't believe they made that movie. Um, and H2O is uh, uh, the movie I've seen the least of all these movies. Maybe I'm biased, Damon. But here tonight, I have to tell you, out of all of these, my favorite is indeed Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, our titular uh, movie for tonight's podcast, I think is my favorite of the seven, is the is to me the best of the seven, because it delivers on the premise of Friday the 13th while upping the ante. So you get everything you need, which is Jason chasing people down and killing them and maiming them in the woods, but this time with a foe that has their own story and can actually stand up against him. So for me, it's got to be the New Blood. Let me give you one point of credit for New Blood that I appreciate. New Blood, one thing that New Blood does differently than every other film on this list is it's a continuation. Mm -hmm. H2O, which I adore, is really a sequel to Halloween 1 and 2. They ignore part 4 and 5. Like, that's basically what Halloween 2018 did by just sequelizing the first one. This one sequelizes part Halloween part 1 and 2. You know, Jamie Lee Curtis, as Laurie Strode, she is still Michael Myers' sister. In this version, she thinks that Michael Myers died in the fire of Halloween 2. And we're catching up 20 years later, but essentially, 
this is a sequel to part two and they ignore part four and five and six um when they get to h2o new nightmare is a meta version it's it's the actors who played in nightmare on elm street playing meta versions themselves now while i do adore that it's not canon you know they didn't continue yeah. nancy thompson's story they didn't continue alice johnson's story it's a whole reinvention of the franchise and texas chainsaw 3d same kind of thing they reinvented they twist things around they make up new stories and it's just wow is that movie um, <laughs> i appreciate that friday the 13th part 7 is just a continuation now there aren't like characters besides jason really carried over they do kind of tell yeah. the history at the beginning so but they're not reinventing it they're not saying this is a start over or right. you know they're bringing back uh, was, is it Alice? Is that the character from the first one? Like they're not bringing. It might have been so Alice. Yeah. Suddenly she's alive, or you know, none of that. Like they're just continuing the story. So I appreciate that. I also want to make one more comment. I know we're not ranking these, Patrick. So I know I'm kind of dogging this a little bit, but I would argue three of the four are really good movies. Mm -hmm. H2O, I love, and I know it's a little bit of a controversial take. I'll say this right now, and this is a real controversial take, Patrick. Rewatching it. I like H two O better than twenty eighteen Halloween. I do. And Whoa, here, that's, that's big. Fine. That's real big. Quick, here's real, real quick because the one thing I bump up against is the story, like why Jason go or why Michael Myers goes after Laurie. That still sure. bugs me about twenty eighteen. The, the 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 movie itself is better, like in terms of like the the kills and the just gory graphic nature of it all. That's all great in twenty eighteen. Just that one story plot bugs me with the whole like he has no reason to go after Laurie and he just like they point him in her direction it's kind of it still bugs me to this day that movie's really solid h2o new, new nightmare even you said like that's a really good movie that's a really strong movie really strong entry even though it's a different kind of film and again friday the 13th i'm sorry i'm singling out texas chainsaw 3d <laughs> as the weakest here but i would argue those three others are all really good like it would be hard to rank them because they're all three and that's pretty amazing that the seventh film and these franchises are all actually pretty good. They really are. I, I, it's, it's funny. The Texas Chainsaw one was the final one I was looking up. And I was like, please let it be like Texas Chainsaw the beginning. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't quite remember the order. I was like, let it be the remake or something. <laughs> it says Texas Chainsaw 3. Texas Chainsaw has got a pretty rough history of sequels. Texas Chainsaw 3D is amongst the roughest. It really is. And so uh, it, it was not a fair fight this time. Texas Chainsaw was going down. You mean you're not you're not Wait, enthralled by do your thing cuz is that, is that what you're I'm doing? not I I'm a big fan of Alexander Daddario, but that's just not that's not going to save it for me. Yeah, it's not good. It's so uh, it, that movie. You know what's funny though? I think what we what made us angriest about that movie was like it had the bones of what could have been a decent story and it just went yeah, off the rails. Like it was just like so yeah. out, of, out of left field. Um all right, let's move on to our next category which is the cane hotter of it all. And we already kind of talked around danced around this subject a little bit. We talked about it with best performance when you gave it to Kane Hodder. What makes Kane hotter the definitive Jason? Because I mentioned it earlier. I said this. He's like, you know, he doesn't even show up until the seventh film. Yet, yeah. when you talk to horror fans, particularly Friday the 13th fans, Kane hotter is Jason. So what makes him the definitive Jason? It's quite simple. The rest of the guys were stunt guys who said, all right, I'll do it. That's really what it was. I mean, let's let's be as frank and as honest as it is. They just said, I'll do it. I'll do the job. Kane Hodder said, he's a character. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put intention behind everything he does. He made him an actor in the movie. That why did Freddie overtake Jason at the box office? Freddie was a character. You you knew and understood Freddie's intentions and his emotions and the way he moved throughout the story. Jason was lifeless until Kane Hodder said, I'm going to give him something. You know how hard it is to give a character something that you never see their face, you never hear them speak, and you only ever see one eye? Kane, Kane Hodder gave this character life. Where even the, the live versions, the one through four versions of Jason, were kind of dead fish. He made this character mean something, and that's that's why it counts. 
Kane Hodder, like you're you're right. He took the time to make to make Jason a character and actually give him his own movements his own reactions um he wasn't like we always kind of joke he's like a mindless you know faceless killing machine he's like a great white shark he just kills and kills and kills but you there's a i know this sounds weird to say this i think you kind of mentioned it earlier but like there's an anger in jason Mm -hmm. in this movie there's like an anger in this jason like he's like vengeful and that's different and i know that sounds weird considering yeah he just kills a bunch of people in the movies but like he's mean in this movie like he's a like he's a killing machine in all of them but like again when you talk about like the sleeping bag scene like he bad like that girl really probably was dead after one swipe (laughs) but when you watch the unedited version he just keeps beating the hell out of that sleeping bag like i got something to prove here i'm gonna turn i'm not just gonna kill her i'm gonna turn her into pulp and there's something the intention behind his performance that really makes a difference and it and it does like you can like i said the effects in this movie the jason on this one are the best in my opinion this is the best looking jason but yeah. also the intention behind what he's doing is different and you can tell there's little things he does different in the machinations in his movements it does make a difference and that is the performance of kane hodder and I, i'm saying this is like the non-friday fan i'm saying this is the guy yeah. who's like a casual friday the 13th fan I recognized it, and I was like, "That." It just like when I talked about with the axe scene, like we all know the axe moment, the iconic photo. Even that is like that. Like seeing that moment and seeing him just kind of like slowly raise up the axe, you could just see it differently in the way he did it. Yeah, and that and that carries on to even you know these aren't the greatest movies ever, but it carries on in Manhattan. It carries on in Jason Goes to Hell. It carries on in Jason X. Like there's still something familiar through through all these movies that are wildly different that look nothing like the new blood, but you know that it's Kane Hodder behind the mask and it feels familiar. His movements feel familiar. That counts for everything. So real quick, this is off the cuff. This is not part of our categories. This is your favorite Friday the 13th movie. You've mentioned that one of your favorite horror movies. Can I ask, what is your least favorite Friday the 13th? We haven't done the full franchise yet, and we will yeah. eventually, uh, which, you know, we've reviewed a lot of movies already, but we're going to eventually do the full franchise, so I don't want to spoil that episode, but, like, do you have one that stands out like, oh, my God, this is the worst one of the franchise? Like, I can I can openly admit Freddy's Dead is garbage. It is a oh, awful yeah. movie. Like, it is real, real bad. Uh, it is terrible. And I'm like, when people are like, oh, you're a Nightmare on Elm Street fan, which is your favorite? And I'll talk about it. Like, what about this? I'm like, what movie are you talking about? I have no idea. I've never heard of that one. Uh, <laughs> what is the one, like, what is the one that you're kind of like, oh, man, this is, that's, that's, that's not good. This is, it's really, this is really tough because it, it's, it's down to two. Manhattan is such a lifeless movie. Jason Takes Manhattan is just, there's just nothing to that movie. But aesthetically, it's really pleasing. And there's a couple of decent kills in there, a few. And and again, it's Kane Hodder, and, and he looks great in the suit and everything. So it's like, I like that and appreciate that. But I have to think that X is probably my least favorite because the movie is so bad. It's, I mean, Damon, it's like, if all the other movies were low budget, X must have been no budget, which is crazy because it's the only sci-fi one. It's just the execution is so poor. It's so very poor that it's hard to watch that movie. Now, the kills in it are pretty dynamic. They spent the money on the kills, but like the execution and the acting and the cinematography, everything about it just tanks so hard that it's really hard to enjoy that movie outside of its outrageous kills. I think when we finally do get to X, the kills will be the best thing to talk about because the rest of the movie is trash. I'm actually surprised you didn't go for Jason goes to hell because I actually remember seeing that in the theater and I was like, what is this piece of shit? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, I, it ain't that ain't great either, but it's still like, at least it's made well. <laughs> like you, you can't say that about Jason X. I feel like, so we did your favorite. I feel like for the next Friday the 13th, we have to do the worst. That's why I was getting at that. I was like, I feel like we have to do Fair Jason enough. X now. So, uh, you, know, you did your best you did your worst like you know we're gonna have to get to it eventually so you know you can't they can't all be winners uh i got freddy's <laughs> dead you got jason x apparently um patrick let's talk about what has become probably my favorite category we do each and every week here on the show which is can we survive 
this horror movie. Now, you are the Friday the 13th expert, and I... I always joke when we do the haunted house movies that I would survive because I would just get the fuck out. Like I wouldn't stick around mm-hmm. for any of that shit. Like you start, you show me a, a toilet bowl full of blood, I'm out. But you, as the definitive, now I understand you're putting yourself in the movie not as the definitive Jason Voorhees guy, but you know you know these movies. Yes, Did you survive Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven. I could, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you know that we 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 almost didn't talk about any of the other characters in this movie for good reason they're paper thin they are paper thin like stereotypical archetypical like 80s just dunderheads like almost everybody in this movie except for one other character which we never mentioned uh which is nick kind of her love interest sort of played by kevin spiritus nick survives the movie too I, as a kid, had a big crush on Lar Park Lincoln, you know, like I just did. I, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to be around her. I thought she was super cool and pretty and all that stuff. So I would have put myself in the Nick role. And Nick was about the most level-headed person aside from Tina in the entire movie. So uh, all the rest of the people in this movie are fucking dipshits, Damon. They would have never made it out. They never had a shot. If I'm if I'm kind of sidling up to uh, to Tina, yeah, I'm gonna win. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna survive. She's gonna win. She's gonna save the day because she has all the powers. But I, I'll be smart enough to at least keep my head down until this shit is done. So when I think about Friday the Thirteenth, this is the franchise where I'm least confident in my survival for one reason. Um, I would be the sci-fi writer kid who would fall for <laughs> Melissa and go to the bedroom thinking I'm going to get some. I 100% would be the horny dude who would wa- would absolutely have sex and then just yeah. get butchered. I, f- yeah. I know me. I know me too well. That's me. I 100% would be the guy that would fall for that, and then I would be the one who got gutted. So I'm not even going to lie and say I would survive this movie. I'd like to think I'm smart enough to survive certain horror movies, uh, I think I was like, I would love that showdown with Freddy. I feel like I know enough about Freddy Krueger that I'd be like, man, you don't want to fuck with me, Freddy. I know your <laughs> secrets. Uh, no, the, the key to the key, the joke running joke for Friday the 13th is if you have sex, you die. Well, <laughs> I'll admit if I'm in a cabin in the woods and there's some gorgeous girl sidling up to me and she's like, let's go upstairs. I'm like, all right. And you yep. know what? You could probably tell me in that moment, Jason's going to show up afterwards and kill me. I'd be like, you know what? It's probably worth the risk. Uh, cause you know, great way to go. Dude, out. I'm a, I'm a dude. I'm not going to lie. Patrick, <laughs> I'm a dude. I would 100% be the guy dumb enough to go to the bedroom, get laid and then just get hatcheted. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Uh, that was another edition of Damon's sex corner that we have every, every so often. I'm just saying, like, I'm, just, I'm being honest. <laughs> like, I know me, I know me. I'm not going to make it. Like, I'm not going to make it out. I know better. Yeah, no, fair enough. And, uh, but again, I would have been the guy chasing after Tina. Like I, w- and, and we know Tina's got another agenda. She, her, her, her agenda is never going to be to go upstairs and have a good time. She's got other thing, other fish to fry. And I would have been right by her side. And that would have got me out of this movie. Yeah. You're thinking with one head, I'm thinking with the other one. So you know, <laughs> that's how we get it. Uh, Patrick, this wasn't actually on the categories, but it's our last category. How can we not say this? Cause you know, we always close out with, is it scary now? Yeah. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me just, you know, let me switch off a little bit of this one. Is it scary? I don't know. It's it's a Friday the 13th movie. They're, they're, they're all yeah. you know, sort of scary. Let me throw it back to you. This is your favorite film. Let me let you close out on this, Patrick. You talked at the beginning about how you discovered this film. Now you've seen it all these years later. Yeah. Does it, does it still hold up? And do all the things you loved about it, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, to this day, does it still hold up as why it's your favorite film in this franchise? Every time I watch this movie, it becomes more and more and more clear why it's my favorite in the series. Um, I wish it was more gory. I wish it had a lot of those, those, those natural traits that you expect, which is the outrageous kills and the outrageous gore. Unfortunately, this movie doesn't have that. That's that's the biggest mark this movie has going against it. But it's got an incredible final girl. It's got an incredible uh, story for the Friday the 13th franchise. Because, boy, don't let them get too off track. <laughs> because then they end up in space or in hell. Things things go way too far. 
This was the this was the perfect alignment of all these little things to make the perfect Friday the 13th film because Jason had someone to actually go up against. Jason had someone that was that was actually going to push back. And and they did it and yeah, it's ridiculous. She's a, she's got telekinesis. It's ridiculous, but once you're in on this ride, it's great. This movie still holds up as my favorite, uh, hands down. I, it's it's not even a contest. Yeah, it's a good, it's a fun movie, and I again, I we will one day do the entire franchise, and we'll sort of revisit the ones we've already reviewed because we reviewed part like we reviewed part three a long time ago. Yeah, um, that was like the first one we reviewed was part three, and that was years ago. Um, four years kind of, ago at this point yeah know. we've kind of peppered we've kind of peppered them throughout the series so we'll have to do some sort of different kind of review when we do the whole franchise because we actually have done a lot of these we just haven't done the whole thing um but so i'm not gonna bury i'm not gonna spoil anything by saying like my ultimate ranking but like this one will probably be near the top i gotta be honest like this is a yeah. really solid movie Rewatching it and again i keep saying this going back to the original point i made at the start of this podcast this one has a story and i appreciate that because that's consistently been one of my biggest like i won't say i bump up against it it's just one of the reasons why i've never truly fallen in love with friday the 13th is because the stories are not they're non-existent like and you know and that's fine like again i don't i don't hate anyone who loves this franchise just for me i appreciate the story elements of like nightmare on elm street a little bit better but this one actually has a story it actually has a plot it actually has a worthwhile final girl uh it has a real awesome epic showdown with jason um, yeah, it's it's a fun movie, and I, I kind of grew to appreciate this one more rewatching it. Yeah, this one grows on you. Uh, on its face and on its uh, like broad premise, you go, that's ridiculous. Of course a movie would do this in its eighth outing. This, this franchise needed it, and it got it right here, and it's a shame that it didn't continue on with Tina's story. They could have they could have done that and i think they would have actually had a great series that would have ran through the 90s and then we wouldn't have silly moments like manhattan and ghost to hell and jason in space we wouldn't have had those weird things we would have had the tina story it's a good story um but we got this story and i'll take it i feel like they did i feel like they did carry on tina's story in the comic books because i mentioned on twitter or instagram a while back that they did think like so. the, they did the comic book where it's Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, and they bring in a lot of the other characters because Alice comes back from Number Elm Street. And I'm pretty sure Tina is one of the main characters from the Friday series that comes back along with Tommy Jarvis, if I remember correctly. So yeah, yeah. you'd be crazy yeah. not to bring her back. It, it's it's she's the one. Yeah. Well, there you go, folks. Patrick's favorite Friday the Thirteenth movie on Friday the Thirteenth. We couldn't celebrate this super hol the holy holiday of Halloween of uh of horror movie fans in october then talk about friday the 13th on friday the 13th so a big thank you to everyone that tunes in each and every week to the show we'll be back uh, with more rewind the living day we got a lot of stuff coming up in october plenty more to come this month so stay tuned for all that make sure you check us out on all your favorite podcast platforms apple podcast spotify of course our youtube channel and you can also check us out on all your favorite social media platforms twitter or x or whatever the hell elon's calling it this week facebook and instagram uh you got message you got questions comments movies you'd like us to review send us messages on social media you can also send them to our email which is rot living dead at gmail.com that's rot living dead at gmail.com and you can also hit us up on our own personal social media channels i am at damon martin and you are at director patrick and damon i want to wish you and all of our loyal fans happy four year anniversary to rewind of the living dead we premiered October 14th, 2020. So just a day removed from the release of this. Four years, Rewind of the Living Dead. And we just happened to like be talking about my favorite horror film on the four-year anniversary. Happy anniversary to all our fans, to Damon Martin, the, the brainchild behind this entire thing. We did it. We've made the four-year mark. We've gotten 100-plus uh, uh, episodes Tons of great people that always reach out to us. A kick-ass t-shirt if you need to get that. It's all there, and it's all because of our faithful listeners, uh, our, our, our steadfast host and grandmaster Damon Martin himself, and, uh, and this fucking weirdo over here who absolutely loves Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood. Thank you all for four wonderful years. I hope we have 40 more. 
and let me say one thing just because you mentioned that uh this has been like i i love what i do for my regular day job to be clear you're a filmmaker i work as a journalist in the mixed martial arts industry i adore my job let me be clear about that but this has become my favorite part of every week doing this show i love doing this show i love horror movies i've always loved horror movies and when you and i met each other years ago that was how we kind of between mma and horror was kind of how we became kindred spirits that's how we became friends um yeah And then we started talking about doing this podcast. We launched it, and this podcast has given me such joy. I look forward to it every week. Like, it's just like there's a reason why we go two hours, and it's not because we can't shut up. It's because we enjoy doing this. We love talking about horror films, and this is a blast. Like, this is honestly, this is my favorite part every week. When we do this show, we pick out movies to do. We have fun doing this. Uh, and on a, on, a, on a serious note, this podcast has given me a best friend. And I appreciate that beyond anything else. Uh, because you and I have known each other for years just in passing and running into each other at Comic-Con. But becoming this podcast has actually given me a best friend. And that means more to me uh, than anything else. So I appreciate everything you do for the show, Patrick. And I appreciate all of our listeners, whether you are day one, you were around for The Shining, which was our first episode four years ago, or you're just discovering us for Friday the 13th, part seven. However you found us, however you got here, thank you. We appreciate you listening. We're not going anywhere. This is not like a. This is not like a no. prequel to the end of the show. We are no. We'll we'll celebrate our eight year anniversary soon enough in a few years. So thank you to everyone that tuned in. We appreciate. It. Thank you for everyone that stuck around, subscribes, likes our show, shares our show. We appreciate it, and we will see you guys back next week for another edition of Rewind of the Living Dead. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you then. Peace.